This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at artofdarkpod. All right, we've got some sponsors for the pod now. Wait, what? Every link you need for the things we talk about here is at artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors. First up, books. If you're into this podcast... Odds are you're probably a reader. We've got links to buy new books from bookshop.org and used books from alibris.com. And if you want to listen to your books, we recommend and use audible.com. It's great and the catalog is huge. All right. So if you're listening to this, you are online. Maybe you're very online. You probably have a website or are thinking of starting one. Maybe you want a website like artofdarkpod.com. We built that with WordPress, which is by far the most popular way to create websites. And the single best host for serious WordPress is WP Engine. I've personally used them for over a decade now, and I don't host my websites anywhere else. Go to artofdarkpod.com slash sponsors and click on the WP Engine link to learn more. Finally, the best way to support the show is at patreon.com slash artofdarkpod. Get the bonus After Dark content for every episode, access to the book club, and more. Thanks for supporting Art of Darkness. And I, I don't think that was too painful. I think no, we did a pretty good job good. there. Yeah. Yeah, that sounded good. Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate it. We're back in the dark room. Very special dark room. And for people who are maybe joining us for the first time, normally what a dark room means is we're talking about a subject we've covered in depth. We're doing kind of a breakout session with a friend, a guest, an expert. Um, In this case, it's all three. Um, But this time, instead of covering a subject we've already talked about, I'm thinking of this as a dark room prequel. This is this is. Yeah, Kevin's Kevin's got it. (laughs) This is the darkest room. All right. Yeah. So typically dark rooms follow core subjects because of our rule. We always wait a year and a day uh, after somebody passes away before mm-hmm. we even dare to cover them. Yeah. However, we have planned to do a blood Meridian book club event for a while now before mm-hmm. the great Cormac McCarthy passed away. Yeah. We, we thought, why don't we bring one of the go-to folks uh, in terms of Cormac, all things Cormac, onto the pod? He actually came to us mm-hmm. and said, let's go. And I know both <laughs> Brad and I are, are really wondering one thing about the great novel, Blood Meridian. And I, I think we have the man who's up for the task, who's ready to answer this question with us. The great Aaron Gwynn is going to help us determine or understand or try to grok what the judge is the judge of. Aaron, welcome <laughs> to the darkest of the dark rooms. No small task. You have a substack devoted entirely to Blood Meridian. Where yeah, do you want to begin? Yeah. Blood Meridian Substack, if you're interested, uh, follow me over on Twitter at American Gwen and get to it that way. Um, tell you what, if, if you and Brad don't mind, let's hop into the judge's first appearance okay, in the novel. Uh, and okay, I'll read now, it. Fair, fair <laughs> enough. What the hell is Blood Meridian? Hmm. Why are people who have no business talking about Blood Meridian talking about blood meridian right now why do we have any business talking about blood meridian why should people care why would we make an exception the three of us brad Mm -hmm. and i the hosts you our friend and frequent guest why would we make an exception here 
Hmm. That's great. So let's start there and then we'll get to the judge. Blood Meridian is a very, it's the most famous book that has not been widely famous. Hmm. Blood Meridian, uh, as long as I can remember it, being around English departments has been whispered at first in hallways and corridors, has been a password between people and then became a legend and then became a standard set in the same breath with Moby Dick and Absalom Absalom and As I Lay Dying and uh, uh, Invisible Man and Beloved it is one of the books. If it's not the great American novel, like Ed Tom Bell says, No Country for Old Men, it'll do till the great American novel gets here. <laughs> I like that. So I read it for the first time, 1999. The great Brian Evanson, fiction writer, was teaching a class, um, uh, the fiction of violence that summer. And he was teaching Blood Meridian. And he and he kept saying, man, you've got to read this. I wasn't in the class. It's a friend of mine. He's like, got to read this book. And he just thought it was very, very, very special. Um and it is, uh, in 2005, editors, literary agents, and authors in New York City and bigwigs in publishing were polled as to the most um, significant work of fiction. I forget what they said the past, the past 25 years or the past 50 years. And so not, they unanimously uh, picked Beloved as number one. And then number two, Blood Meridian was tied with Don DeLillo's Underworld. So those three books have been massively, massively read, massively influential. Blood Meridian has become so incredibly influential that people are influenced by it who have never read of it, never read it or heard of Cormac McCarthy. So the video games Dead Red Redemption yeah. And Dead Red Redemption 2, played by millions of people, right, mm -hmm. were directly influenced, were brought into being because yeah, of Meridian. Yeah, I think it's Red Dead Redemption. But yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 100%. That's all right. Yeah. It's, yeah. So it has, it has influenced so uh, much fiction, so much television, so many video games, so many films right that mm -hmm. it's launched people's careers that that never reference it so <laughs> it, uh, it has been this locus of of cultural and artistic power and is also the most violent piece of media that i believe the vo most violent piece of media that has ever existed it's extraordinarily violent uh and and yet somehow it also feels like a deeply spiritual book it it has it's a book that that genuinely feels like more than a book uh mm -hmm. it feels somehow like more than a novel uh and i i don't think i'm overhyping it i i was rereading it here recently in preparation for this episode and it is truly staggering you can't say enough about it but we're gonna try <laughs> yeah. we're gonna all try. right yeah no, that now that I I love what you say there, Kevin, about a book that seems to be more than a book, and there there are these there are tons of great novels and memoirs, biographies, works of history in American literature, poetry, screenplays, plays, etc. There are a handful of books that feel like the characters live beyond the page. There are a handful of books that that. People are always reading. They finish yeah. it. They start it over again. Moby Dick is a book like that. When I yeah. interviewed uh, Colson Whitehead earlier this year, he said that he's, his quote was, I am always reading Moby Dick. <laughs> he's read yes. it before, but he just keeps it around. Yeah. He says, if I have insomnia, I get up in the middle of the night, I'll read it's a couple of chapters. Dick. Right? Yeah. So people have, there is a certain kind of book people have that relationship with. And Blood Meridian is that kind of obsessional foundational work right yeah. and i think that statement and i don't know if he meant it in this clever way but the way i would you know read that is that or take that to mean is that 
if it's anything like the way it's felt for me rereading Blood Meridian, you put the book down at the end of the night, you wake up the next day, you're driving along the road, and you're still reading the book. Yeah. It has, and I think particularly probably as an American living in the West or from the West, the center mm-hmm. of the country, wherever you live in America, really, it is it is a deeply, deeply American novel. It is deeply about America. America. I, I I think you could you could do a reading purely about that. The whole, the entire oh, yeah. thing is a metaphor for the American experiment, the American project. The, you could very easily do a PhD saying the kid is America, and this is what is meant by that. And you may be right, you may be wrong. <laughs> right, that's part of the genius of it. I mm. taught it a year ago in a in a contemporary fiction class, and we started it. And it's all you know. I've taught it for since. 2001. So I've been teaching it over 20 years in college classrooms and big lecture class. We start talking about blood meridian, the opening pages. And, you know, some people are kind of like, Oh my gosh, you know, it's the darkness, it's, you know, it's too much. And this one young man in front, Matthew, if you're listening, you're awesome. He said, you can walk outside and walk down to the street and feel this on the street. Mm, yeah and I'm like, oh man what do you mean that's like this presence this darkness this violence you can feel it and i'm like yeah. this yeah. guy gets it this young yeah. man gets it you can if you're tuned in right if you put down your fucking latte mm-hmm. right yep you if you out. put down your yep put down your copy of fixiones yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have that too. You could have that too. You have that mm-hmm. right next to your copy of Blood Meridian, mm-hmm. and they talk mm-hmm. to each other for sure. They do one hundred percent. And and Aaron, if you and if if you have to explain that to somebody, that's like explaining jazz to somebody. Mm-hmm. It, can't explain it's, it, right? I can't explain it. Uh, but yeah. it's there. I I was I I ahead of this. I you know I I read blood meridian at least three times all the way through and i think maybe four and so ahead of this you know i, I kind of recognize well hey i'm not going to be able to read the whole novel I, I my copy is very marked up so i went through and read particular passages that i had sort of noted to myself before but then i just decided i was going to read two chapters just randomly literally just flip through the first time i hit a full chapter i'm just going to read that chapter and it's funny because i read it and i was like Oh, this is the fa- my favorite chapter of a book I've ever read. <laughs> and like, is it even the best chapter in the book? I don't even know, honestly. But I remember reading that last night, putting that down and just thinking like, as a writer, thinking like, Jesus, I got to step my game up, man. Like, how the fuck, how, like, if this is out there, like, what's even, and, and not, I don't say this in a dispirited way because I, I'm up for a challenge. But as a writer, I read that and I'm like, God damn, what am I going to (laughs) do? This is the effect. This is the effect that it has on fiction writers. And I don't think, like, I've heard people say this is gendered and that sort of, I don't buy that. I know a bunch of women novelists, women nonfiction writers, particularly when McCarthy passed, women hosting the great uh, Maggie Doherty, who writes for the New Republic. She, R.I.P., this is why I started writing. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I started writing because so I don't think it's like a man. McCarthy's wow. a man's writer. Okay, maybe, but he's beloved by right. women readers. Um, yeah, yeah. So the yeah. challenge, man, it makes you feel as a writer. You're like, I gotta up my game. Yeah, yeah. And it's it, so honestly, funny. and it did for me as uh, developing as a writer. And I still have a lot of development to do. But like early on, when I think I started reading McCarthy around 2006. Um, ambitiously writing my own stuff and was like, oh, there are actually levels to this game that I didn't even quite recognize. Like, the, I, I've been playing around. Um, there's like a whole nother and and, and, and not to try and cop. And then the challenge is, how do I try to do this without cop like copying him, right? Or parodying him or being obviously influenced in every sentence by him. And that's also a challenge, but yeah. Hmm. Yeah, he's he's also it's also very very funny. 
It's extraordinarily <laughs> bloody, but there's a great deal of humor, gallows humor, Hilarious. and even little yeah. cheeky meta jokes. Uh, you can talk about the fact that one of the characters' names is Webster, and you mm -hmm. should probably have your dic dictionary open when you're reading <laughs> this right, novel. Right, right. I think that's a little bit of an amusing uh, sort of almost Brechtian wink. It could, mm -hmm. maybe it's not, right? That's the other thing. Like, there's enough in here that it's going to be a war shock and it's going to meet you where you are and you're going to have your own. I mean, this is true of, of everything, but this works on, like Brad said, on uh, something of a different level. I'm a I'm a dramatist, and the dramaturgy of this, the way the scenes work, there is a cinematic quality to it. Uh, and typically, if you were to say that of a novel, it might be a, be pejorative. Not in this case. No. Uh, see, see, yeah. this is this is. McCarthy, okay, well, you talk about the 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 tradition or the question of the or the dialogue about the great American novel. Um, Blood Meridian or, or McCarthy's Ouve generally is the first participant in that conversation to me that is clearly inspired by cinema. You have people like David Foster Wallace and Don DeLillo um, and others who are. Um, part of the sort of post cinematic uh you, you know with they they exist in a universe where cinema has been around for a long time but they're not as obviously influenced by by cinema as i think mccarthy is and you see this more maybe in some of his other novels than you do actually in blood meridian um but they're not uh to me they're consciously aware of that rather than um, I've just seen a lot of movies and haven't written any book, read many books, and I'm trying to write a novel. It's not that. It's, no, it's 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 this is actually part of this is part of the the source material that he's drawing from to create these things. Yeah. And not only is it a western itself, it is this story that you can fully inhabit um, as a reader. John Gardner calls this the vivid and continuous dream of fiction. Right. That as a reader, you enter the great. We all know that experience. Right. I mean, I, I don't care what Lord of the Rings movie or TV series they make. It can be all it can all be fine. That stuff is never going to be as good as the movie in my head. The vivid and continuous dream. Right. The, the book. So, it's never going to yeah. be as good as the book. That's right. right. And this and the dream that the book creates in your mind as you read that fluid vivid continuous dream so not only is blood meridian that it is also formatted like books were in the 1850s it is a pastiche yeah right with the head notes yeah. the, this was a common uh, uh top topographical topographical sorry thing mm -hmm. that uh publishers did authors did um, in the 1840s, yeah, and it's it's interesting. So I I've, I've looked a little bit into that. It it's not it's a apparently one of the terms for this is a gloss, um, and it's not um, it's sort of summary, um, but it's almost like you might describe it as like bullet pointed summary. It's right. not telling you exactly. It's like what's the it's happen. like the beats of the chap of the chapter, mm -hmm. like like if you yeah. were if you were uh, writing it. You might go, okay, this is, it's your beats as you're moving yeah. the chapter from A to Z. But yeah, 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 without giving it away. Yeah. Because McCarthy was writing this, because he published this in 1985, as opposed to 1885, he messes with you even in the those head notes, right? Mm -hmm. So just mm -hmm. one particular instance, a chapter, you have the head note, the washer women at the Ford. And when you get to that moment, you find women who have been scalped and are dead in a river. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's almost a, there's almost, yeah, and, and that is, I mean, we may, you don't have to dig into it. That is almost like a fourth wall breaking moment to That's me, right. doing that. That's there, right. there is a, like this, this story is going to break through any kind of conventional structure that you're trying to put around it. Yeah. Now, Brad, do we have anything special planned for the After Dark for Patreon? Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. We're going to go as long as it takes with the great Aaron Gwynn here mm -hmm. to get his insights into this novel. But we're also going to make some extra time for Patreon. Well, 
be part. I, I have a couple of things that I'd like to talk about. We'll see what we get to in this. There's there's a couple of things I definitely want to hit, and I think makes sense maybe to save more for the after dark. Aaron Gwynn not only is the Blood Meridian, he's the man, the Blood Meridian guy. He's who you go to when you want to know more about Blood Meridian. He's also a man who shares a deep well of wisdom about publishing and about writing. And I want to talk in the after dark about if Cormac McCarthy had been born in 1980, would he have a career? Would Blood Meridian, if it landed on the desk of some agent somewhere, and in, in 2015, rather than 1985, would it have got seen that would it have ended up at a Barnes and Noble end cap? That's I would just want to figure out. And I'm, I don't have an opinion necessarily, but I'm, I'm curious what you think. Curious what Aaron thinks. I'm curious what I think. Uh, so that's that's patreon.com. We'll do that. We've on got the other stuff, dark. too. Yeah. yeah. As a tease, as a tease to that. Blood Meridian was remaindered. It. McCarthy was virtually unknown. He was known by writers, but none of his none of his books sold more than um, five thousand copies. Blood Meridian. Published hey, that's pretty it. good. That's pretty good these days. That's pretty good these days. <laughs> Blood Meridian is published. It didn't sell through its print run of fifteen hundred. Wow. It, so it didn't sell through the print run. Was remaindered and went out of print. What do those first editions go for now? Do we know? I held one at Lemuria Books in Jackson, Mississippi, in their rare books room when I was on tour there in 2004. And that was at the time, and it was going for $5,000. Should have bought now, that. <laughs> that's, I should have bought it. I should have been an investment for sure. I should have bought it. Now, yeah. I have no idea what a first edition, you know, fine copy. There's no telling, particularly. I will... I right now that he's passed and and by the way we need I mean rest in pre, uh, peace to a great one. I mean I oh, said dude, this we're doing before. we're doing yeah. this because like it's the end of an era in a certain way. It's like the end and, of an era. Yeah. And we will be coming back next year with the proper Cormac mm -hmm. core episode most probably with Aaron uh, mm -hmm. tagging along joining mm -hmm. us uh for that and uh tagging along i make it i make it sound like you're <laughs> like you're <laughs> <laughs> no we will have uh aaron on for that for sure um but i've said this before and i'm going to say it again on this podcast uh i i don't we don't typically get sentimental on this this pod but we are american writers living in the world today circa 2023 depending on how much you care for the arts and letters how highly you rank the arts and literature and we rank them very highly on art of darkness Sorry. yeah we not only lost probably our greatest living writer one of the very short list at at the top we may have lost the greatest living american certainly top 10 mm -hmm. to 20 mm -hmm. whatever field end you care era. about yeah. end of an era <laughs> So, and, and, you know, I know sometimes people can get a little turned off by overhype. It's too much. Uh, and so let me just hedge and say, it's a hundred percent, absolutely worth every, every single bit of hype as somebody who, uh, is a literature respecter. Uh, it's picking it back up again. It's just, it's remarkable. In any case, Aaron, mm -hmm. I have, I have you a price on a first edition blood meridian now. Oh, what's that? Forty thousand dollars. Oh, could have made a cool thirty-five grand on that you bad he, boy. You think he's selling it here? I don't yeah. think so. Hey, invest yeah. in literature, people. Yeah, <laughs> that's better returns than uh, dude. C Mac didn't make that much money on it yeah. for a couple yeah. decades, probably. So now, Aaron, yeah. you you just had a piece come out today. Uh, was it in the Spectator? In the in Spectator. Uh, uh web edition and and print um in the uh and the print issue is the august issue and this is just like letting people know hey um by the way i should uh, add that the day mccarthy um passed blood meridian went to number eight out of all books on amazon all books so that's against the like 10 ways to un-F your life. And like, That's right. Yeah, right. 
Number eight. Number eight. So for the first time, Blood Meridian became a New York Times paperback bestseller. Oh, man. That's the best so <laughs> My piece was like, okay, folks, you people who have heard of Cormac McCarthy and didn't pull the trigger till you heard he died, you've so you've decided to get a copy of Blood Meridian delivered to your front door. <laughs> what, are, what are you in for? What's uh, Live, laugh, scalp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So do we want to do we want to dive into the judge the first time we see him? Yeah, yeah. let's do that. You've been let's waiting patiently, and so has the audience. Yeah, yeah. And we've just been yeah. No, this is great. Let's do it. The Reverend Green had been playing to a full house daily as long as the rain had been falling, and the rain had been falling for two weeks. When the kid ducked into the ratty canvas tent, there was standing room along the walls, a place or two, and. Such a heady reek of the wet and bathless that they themselves would sally forth into the downpour now and again for fresh air before the rain drove them in. He stood with others of his kind along the back wall. The only thing that might have distinguished him in that crowd was that he was not armed. Neighbors, said the reverend. He couldn't stare out of these here hell, hell, hell holes right here in Nacogdoches. I said to him, I said, you going to take the son of God in there with you? And he said, oh, no, no, I ain't. And I said, do you know that he said I will follow you always even under the end of the road? Well, he said, I ain't asking nobody to go nowhere. And I said, neighbor, you don't need to ask. He's going to be with there whether you stick every step ever, whether you ask it or not. I said, neighbor, you can't get shed of him. Now, are you going to take him, him? And to that hell hole yonder? You ever see such a place for rain? The kid had been watching the reverend. He turned to the man who spoke. He wore long mustaches after the fashion of Teamsters, and he wore a wide brim hat with a low round crown. He was slightly wall eyed, and he was watching the kid earnestly as if he'd know his opinion about the rain. I just got here said the kid. Will it be tall I ever seen? The kid nodded. An enormous man dressed in an old cloth slicker had entered the tent and removed his hat. He was bald as a stone, and he had no trace of beard, and he had no brows to his eyes nor lashes to them. He was close on to seven feet in height, and he stood smoking a cigar even in this nomadic house of God. And he seemed to have removed his hat only to chase the rain from it. For now he put it on again. The reverend had stopped the sermon altogether. There was no sound in the tent. All watched the man. He adjusted the hat and then pushed his way forward as far as the crepe board pulpit where the reverend stood. And there he turned to address the reverend's congregation. His face was serene and strangely childlike. His hands were small. He held them out. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel it my duty to inform you that the man holding this revival is an imposter. He holds no papers of divinity from any institution recognized or improvised, he is altogether devoid of the least qualification to the office he has usurped and is only committed to memory a few passages from the good book for the purpose of lending to his fraudulent sermon some faint flavor of the piety he despises. In truth, the gentleman standing here before you posing as a minister of the Lord is not only totally illiterate, but is also wanted by the law in the states of Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Arkansas. Oh, God, cried the reverend. Lies, lies. He began reading feverishly from his open Bible. On a variety of charges, the most recent of which involved a girl of 11 years, I said 11, who he had come to in trust and whom he was surprised in the act of violating while actually clothed in the livery of his God. A moan swept through the crowd. A lady sank to her knees. 
This is him, cried the reverend, sobbing. This is him, the devil. Here he stands. Let's hang the turn, crawled, called an ugly thug from the gallery to the rear. Not three weeks before this, he was run out of Fort Smith, Arkansas, for having Congress with a goat. Yes, lady, that is what I said. Goat. Well, damn my eyes if I won't shoot the son of a bitch, said a man rising at the far side of the tent, and drawing a pistol from his boot, he leveled it and fired. The young teamster instantly produced a knife from his clothing and unseen the tent and stepped outside into the rain. The kid followed. They ducked low and ran across the mud toward the hotel. Already gunfire was general within the tent and a dozen exits had been hacked through the canvas walls and people were pouring out, women screaming, folks stumbling, folks trampled underfoot. The bald-headed man was already at the bar when they entered. On the polished wood before him were two hats and a double handful of coins. He raised his glass, but not to them. They stood up to the bar and ordered whiskeys, and the kid laid his money down, but the barman pushed it back with his thumb and nodded. His hair's on the judge, he said. They drank. The teamster set his glass down and looked at the kid, or he seemed to, you couldn't be sure of his gaze. The kid looked down the bar to where the judge stood. The bar was that tall, not every man could get his elbows up on it, but it came just to the judge's waist, and he stood with his hands placed flatwise on the wood, leaning slightly, as if about to give another address. By now, men were piling through the doorway, bleeding, covered in mud, cursing. They gathered about the judge. A posse was being drawn to pursue the preacher. Judge, how did you have the, the goods on that no account? Goods, said the judge. When you was in Fort Smith. Fort Smith? Well, where did you know him to know all that stuff on him? You mean the Reverend Green? Yes, sir. I reckon you was in Fort Smith before you come out here. I was never in Fort Smith in my life. Doubt that he was. They looked from one to the other. Well, where was it you run up on him? I never laid eyes on the man before today. Never even heard of him. He raised his glass and drank. There was a strange silence in the room. The men looked like mud effigies. Finally, someone began to laugh. Then another. Soon they were all laughing together. Someone bought the judge a drink. <laughs> oh, great scene. Great, well read. That was exceptional. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Yeah. So many little details in there. I mean, are I, I am always struck by. Well, go ahead, Kevin. Look, you, you have something to say. How does he how does he get away in this novel with creating a character in the judge who feels like a collective hallucination and yet doesn't suffer from the sophomoric, the typical sophomoric uh, workshop judgment that you would levy against somebody who does that? A larger than life character, <laughs> mythic feeling, and yet fully present. And by the end of the novel, you don't. You don't say, oh, this is just corny. It's just a dream in the end. And like, how does it, how is that accomplished? What does it all mean? Help me, Aaron. I'm drowning. <laughs> I think that it has something to do with the Shakespearean breath of life that McCarthy breathes into the judge. I think that we, even if we don't think about it consciously, we feel the channeling of Iago, of Milton Satan. And of Ahab, the 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 judge's forebears. Oh, but he he is both Ahab and the whale, isn't he? Yes, <laughs> he's, there's something otherworldly about him. Just yeah. a little there's little such other... an incredible moment in the novel, and it's about midway through, which I'll confess is a, is where I am right now in my rereading of it. A little a little past midway, uh, where the judge 
they've they've accomplished their first uh, sortie and have collected uh, any number of scalps, and they come into one of the Mexican cities and are greeted as conquering heroes. And he ends up in the the baths with the other men as they're getting the gory, uh, all the blood off of them, and he he squats into the bath. Uh, with his cigar burning, uh, pecked away in one of his ears, right. and he grins. And I just, as a as a modest artist myself, you can uh, you can almost feel McCarthy taking a victory lap as he writes this somehow. Mm. Like there, there's a strange feeling, and I know Brad has this question too: Who the hell is the narrator of this book? Uh, but it just, I don't know what it is about that moment where I just, it, it, it almost feels like the, the author somehow being self-satisfied knowing that he's trapped you in his world, which is also the world of the judge, which of course is the metaphor within the metaphor for the Gnostic Mm -hmm. allegory that blood Meridian is. So the novelist has succeeded in trapping you inside of his dream. And if you're a Gnostic respecter and you believe the Demiurge has us all trapped inside his dream, then Cormac has succeeded in uh, ah, well, yes, mim- if, if this, mimicking if, the Demiurge in if his this world. world. If this world could be created by a lesser god, then it may very well be creatable by anyone else. Right. By just by some guy in America. Yeah. Mm. In the 80s. Anyway. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Not the Deep idea. thoughts. Yeah, the Gnostic idea is an idea of representation, that that the God that we think in the Judeo-Christian world is Jehovah, is Yahweh, mm-hmm. is actually an imposter called the Demiurge. And the Demiurge, Demiurge uh, has trapped all of us, souls, in physical matter, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But there, there is a spark of divinity from the true God who is beyond the world, right? And maybe in each of us, maybe not, but in some of us, definitely. And then there are these dark figures who move through the world called archons. And the archons try to gobble up those people who have these sparks of divinity. The other great Sounds right to me. Yep, that tracks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm yeah, half well, kidding. Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> and confirm. Right. Mm, yeah, <laughs> it's certainly it is certainly a vibe. The other yeah. uh, great piece of media that is explicitly about this is, of course, Twin Peaks. Uh, mm. Is very much mm. about the the archons and a Gnostic. In part, you can yeah. yeah in in any case for reference for people. Mm. Well, and 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 just. While we're on the Twin Peaks subject, there is a a tr- there is a sort of sub genre of American literature which seems to be aware that the American continent, the North American continent, is occupied by some sort of uh, chthonic uh, uh, demon, basically, which has uh, had its hand at the till of his of of history um twin peaks is one of them uh blood meridian is 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 potentially one of them um uh cities of the red knight by william s burroughs is another Uh, there are a handful of these but um it's an interesting uh, this is this is like a pet interest of mine in the last couple of years anyway so blood meridian is like the capstone of this sub sub genre and it's all it's other things as well it's not simply that but let me tell it tell a tale out of school Mm -hmm. so my buddy philip meyer wrote uh picador uh which is the arm of uh pan mcmillan uh in the uk uh philip and i share an agent uh peter strauss and um that peter was an editor at Picador was McCarthy's editor at Picador, but incidentally, um, and Picador wanted to re-release an issue of Blood Meridian. Ooh, oh, he's got it. He's got it on hand. Right. So oh, I've seen this one. That's a, I love yeah. That's one of my favorite covers. Philip has uh, the introduction. Uh, Philip Meyer, great novel, by the way, The Sun, recommend to everyone who loves uh, Blood Meridian. 
Fantastic. Um, and also did his uh, MFA at UT Austin where Brad and Kevin did yeah, their- he was uh, he graduated a year before us. I think I yeah. I hung out with him a time or two. Yeah, great let's guy. Go. So, yeah, let's go. So so Philip wrote this introduction and he kicked it back and forth with uh, McCarthy's agent and the Picador editor. I have that PDF like right here. Very and cool. at one point in his introduction, Meyer writes. Or, I'm sorry, he had written, it seems that McCarthy is using a Gnostic idea, something like that, right? This seems Gnostic. Mm -hmm. And McCarthy crossed that out and wrote, it is Gnostic. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's right there. I yeah. and I'm glad he's not being coy about it because it really is explicitly that. Well, well, I mean, we could spend a, a lot of time talking about the trajectory of Gnostic ideas throughout his oeuvre ending in Stella Maris, which is distinctly Gnostic without with even less coy than possible than depending on how you read things, even less coy than blood meridian, but it's in there in the road. It's per, it's there very in prominent in the road um, as well. And, and I, I don't see it as much in say the, the, the border trilogy, but I'm sure a close reading would find it. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it is there in a uh, judge. Uh, I'm not judge. I'm sorry. Sheriff. Bell's dream at the end of No Country for Old Men, yes. where yeah. he dreams about the, his father riding through past the mountains, fire and a horn, carrying the fire, going out in all that dark. Mm. Like that's, fire, that's, all that. that's the divine spark. That's yeah. the divine spark, right? So, I mean, McCarthy has been thinking about this stuff at least since after Sutri. Mm -hmm. and, and you see a hint, a hint, a shading of the judge and the final paragraph of Sutri. Mm, yeah, all right. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> right? So a beautiful, mournful final paragraph that addresses directly the reader and breaks into first person. Somewhere in the gray wood by the river is the huntsman, and in the brooming corn, and in the castellated press of cities. His work lies all wares, and his hounds tire not. I have seen them in a dream, slaverous and wild, and their eyes crazed with ravening for souls in this world. Fly them. Good Lord. <laughs> right? So he's yeah. been thinking about this at least since Sutri. Yeah. Yeah. and by this i mean the gnostic right. trajectory right. right and this isn't a uh, podcast about gnosticism but i am on the wikipedia and just very briefly the etymology of the word of course is that gnosis refers to knowledge based on personal experience or perception in a religious context gnosis is mystical or esoteric knowledge based on direct participation with the, the divine in most Gnostic systems, the sufficient cause of salvation is this knowledge of or acquaintance with the divine. Yeah. And we could go on for a well, long time. Well, let me time. let me speak. This is I've yeah. spent a lot of time thinking and write, reading about Gnosticism. Yeah. Let me just append it, that. It's also yeah. heresy. But well. go on. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Um so <laughs> um yeah, you uh, have to said. yeah so so I mean there there are other aspects of the, to think about this. Gnosticism refers to a broad range of different sects of most people generally consider it um, heretical Christianity, early forms of Christianity. It, you think of Christianity as evolving school of thought in which you've got these branched out groups that are heretical and to some degree were stamped out. Um, the particularly what McCarthy is occupying appar apparently or seems to be with works like Blood Meridian falls a little bit more cl uh, clearly into the Manichaean camp. And 
the Manichaeans were obsessed with notions of good and evil, but they also were con very much concerned with the fact that physical matter had a demonic undercurrent to it. This stuff was all built as a ex as a by the demiurge in order to trap you and force you to forget your divinity. Right. And so the Gnostic concept was like, hey, wake up. This isn't everything. There is what you should be trying to do is trying to figure out how to bring your spark back to God, um, which isn't anywhere around, around these parts. <laughs> right. Um, so there are schools of thought within there are schools, uh, uh, sex or there were that would be considered Gnostic whose belief systems don't quite square exactly with that. Um, and there are undercurrents of Gnosticism in actually, it turns out, all religious systems um, that have any any school of thought within a religious system that believes it has um, found a way to access direct experience with the, the divine is technically a form of Gnosticism. So you could be a Gnostic Hindu. You could be a Gnostic Buddhist. Um, it, it just it. In when we're talking about it, we're we're actually thinking about a sliver of Gnosticism, generally considered Manichaeanism or Valentinism. Um, the Essenes were sort of in this camp as well, but um, a primary. So so oftentimes the sort of meme level is like the Gnostics think the world is evil, <laughs> which is true enough for our conversation. Yeah. That's great, Brad. Yeah. Like that that breakdown, I think, is really helpful. Mm -hmm. I've I've read um, Elaine Pagel's uh, The Gospel of Thomas, mm -hmm. which gives yep. the Gnostic ideas, unpacks one of the Gnostic quote not. I've read her The Gnostic Gospels, which yep. is quite. I need to read it again before I said anything whatsoever about it. But it's fascinating. I think I got more out of your thirty second <laughs> to a minute breakdown than I have oh, um, so many pages i've read so that's that's fantastic i yeah. think that um it well it's it's easy to understand why kevin's reaction was the reaction of the church that that this is heretical because this is dangerous stuff it is i mean this is dangerous stuff especially if you're going to say like oh you know you're not um you weren't just made by god the father you're made of God the Father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and here's here's another thing too about especially the the Christian Gnostic sects like the Manichaean the, the Manichaeans and others. One thing that they would say is they would take a text like the Bible and they would say, "Here's how to actually read it." <laughs> and wow. it's not that they don't think, say, the story of Genesis was um, was somehow divinely inspired. They think there is a they're 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 interpreters they're literary theorists they say there's a story below this story that is the real story right not saying that's necessarily true but you can you can boil this down and we can get off the gnosticism thing in a little bit but there's you know there are were gnostic sects that believed the serpent in the garden of eden was the hero very interesting right right that's going to cause a little bit of uh yeah. trouble when you <laughs> when you meet when you meet with the bishop that's problematic. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, reading about, I'm reading about the Cathars. Yeah, canceled, but excommunicated. Mm -hmm. um, it, are the Cathars similar to the Manichaeans, Brad? They're, it, they definitely there's there's major overlap. Yeah, the Cathars are in that the 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 physical reality is evil school. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, well, here's mm, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, no, please, please. No, no. I mean, it's just uh, the the Catharism Wikipedia just goes so hard. It's just super metal, right? So here's just like random other beliefs, and the Cathars were a Gnostic sect that I believe were were wiped out. Were, um, yeah, in the Albigensian Crusade. Correct. Here's why I think uh, the judge works because <laughs> it, it invites the kind of speculation and, and unpacking of philosophy that we're doing right here. Mm -hmm. This character invites that at the same time, he is grounded in a seven foot hairless albino with alopecia who is, who is competent 
an orator, uh, expert in violence, cultured, the all around, the all around man, yeah. plus evil, right? So he's anchored in a real presence and yeah. physicality, right? So you have that doubleness. You have the the physical surface of the judge, the physical attributes of the judge combined with well, is this like a Manichaean thing? Is this like a Gnostic thing? Is what's the right? So you have both things abutting and creating this weird tension. I don't know if you guys have ever known, it's a very particular type, man. A guy who's six, eight or over moving through the world is a different kind of person mm -hmm. and is interacting with people in a different way. It's yeah. very interesting to watch. There was a mm. World Cup. Some years ago, there was a referee, this guy may be famous for all I know, who was about seven feet tall, bald, and just a presence. And he commanded that entire space. And like other referees, you know, there's always a kind of between players and referees, a kind of argumentative. That there was none of that with this. <laughs> yeah, he's just. <laughs> I, there's something about, and by the way, I'm 5'8", so mm -hmm. I'm not like saying this like, oh, respect the big... I'm just right. saying, hey. Oh no! If you're that size, it's 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 something. I've I've encountered a few of these people of that size. Maybe not even a few. Maybe a couple. And yeah. it is, oof, this guy is. If you know, if we were in some kind of uh, an era of, uh, if we were in an era where there weren't handguns, this guy would be able to do whatever he wanted. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. In an era when when mm. a tall man was five foot nine. Right, right. Most right. men were like five six, yeah. five five. Or they say um, God made man the same. Sam Colt made made them equal. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> yeah, right. for yeah. something like that. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it it does strike me. Of course, these uh, Christological uh, mm -hmm. resonances are all, of course, intentional. Uh, I, and again, I don't, I don't want to uh, border too much on the heretical, but yeah. the more I think about the question I put to you, Aaron about how this character sits in that place. Well, it's clearly a Christ-like place. It's like a superimposition of both things, man and God. The, ju the judge is some sort of perversion of that uh, or, or inversion of that. Um, and it's eerie. <laughs> yeah, can I read a, uh, can I read a little bit? There's a great um there's a great um essay uh oh did I not include the name? Oh, I have it here. The striking the fire out of the rock, Gnostic theology and Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. Let me just read just a little bit just to put this into some context or or add some context, I should say. Quote, whether an archon of judgment an incarnation of Shiva, the many-armed Hindu god of destruction or Lucifer himself the judge in Blood Meridian is this primary initial kind of trickster. And we saw that in the, the passage that Aaron read. That is that is a trickster move. He may be a giant, but it's not quite about physical intimidation, right? That's trickster. That's I'm going to cause anarchy in this moment. If um, I may, too, because mm -hmm. and then in the rest of the novel, do they do they ever step foot in a church that hasn't been completely oh. wrecked? Right. No, of they, course it's not. either wrecked or yeah. they wreck it, I think. Or they yeah. wreck it. Yeah. yeah. And so, of course, the, mm. the, 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 sta I don't know what you call, what do you call statues of saints? Statuary? Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. But sure. anyway, you walk into these churches, there will be a Mary holding the Christ child, but the Christ child's head will have been severed. Oof, right. It's very, it's very, it's very uh, particular. It's, it's intentional. It's very deliberate is the word I'm stumbling for. Yeah, sure. Yeah. hundred well, percent. I mean, how do we meet him? He, you know, you have these, this, I, I, what's the word for him? Some sort of Protestant preacher. Uh, and he disrupts the service and the tent gets slashed and he accuses him of being a pedophile and a goat fucker. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty hilarious. Oh, I, can I, I, I just admire the right, the, the move at, from a, writing craft standpoint when the the teamster fella just cuts unseams the tent with his knife and they step out there's something that will i will have that in my head forever i i don't know what it is about that it just works your your reality is so flimsy yep. 
I'll just cut it wide open. And yeah. if I can do I, this to the tent of God, what could I do t- unto you? Hmm. Well, also, there's like with this book, there's all this metaphysical cool stuff, but it's grounded in the particular. Don't forget the judge ends up with the reverend's fucking offering. When they go into the bar, the judge is there with hat, a hat with a handful of coins. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he's chaos, but he is chaos for a reason. He is yes. order. I want that money. Mm-hmm. And I will do whatever s- arrangement of, of, of events that I can kick off to get to that point, right? It's a it's so it, it It's so funny that he does, he talks like a lawyer uh, frequently. In in the novel, that is so funny. Well, I think that's why everybody. Be- I, I think that's why everybody believes him. It's so you can't just stand up and be like, "Ah, he fucked a goat." That's not going to quite work, right? No, you need but to if have, you come up and you've got hmm. specifics, and he was here and he was there, and oh well, you understand that the state of Mississippi, and mm-hmm. you know, right? Like people are uh, epistemologically, everybody's like, "Well, okay, sure. yeah, yeah." Right. But you as the reader, you enjoy the irony of it because you know, of course, this is yeah. some sort of devilish flim yeah. flammery. Yeah. Yeah. Very fun. Yeah. And so, of course, then what your job is, is to be the judge yourself. So you get judge, to judge, judge the judge, judge the judge. And that none of that's accidental. I could see Aaron has something in front of him. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, I'm, I, Brad wanted, was wanting to read the stuff. From yeah. Me. Let me let me finish this a little. Oh, bit yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, my yeah. gosh. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, that's be- OK. Before you, before you do, I just want to put a put a pin in uh, Aaron's a bug in, in Aaron's ear, which is yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I mentioned it yet, but we want to know. We really do want to know who the hell you think the narrator of this book is. Yeah. Don't answer now. But yeah, we want to know. There. OK, yeah. go ahead, Brad. Yeah. So let, let me let me just finish. It's It's quite short. Um, Although there are overt references to Holden's somewhat satanic nature throughout, he is not the grim adversary of God who brings about the ruination of Adam and Eve and tempts Christ in his wanderings or the philosophical enemy of Faust. He is rather the tempter trickster of folklore, the prosecutor old scratch uh, of Bennett's uh, the devil and Daniel Webster, the wily blues man of Robert Johnson's crossroads, the fiddler of Charles, Charlie Daniels, the devil, devil went down to Georgia. I like this framing him as a, as having a trickster component, right? He is the Miltonic Satan, but he is also the fiddle player in the devil and the devil went down to Georgia. And I think there's some truth to that. Let me just read a little bit more like Loki, like Lucifer, the judge is at war with the authority of the universe. He resents God's omnipotence and omniscience and wishes to seize as much of it as he can. As he inscribes his own book with his natural findings in the manner of a Joseph Banks, the book is consistently referred to as a ledger, not as a journal for recording knowledge, but as a ledger where accounts are totaled and settled. When Toadvine questions his constant writing and collecting of specimens, Holden tells him that whatever in creation exists without my knowledge exists without my consent, challenging God's role as chief arbiter of nature. He goes on to say, this is the last little bit, the man who believes that the secrets of the world are forever hidden lives in mystery and fear. But that man who sets himself the task of singling out the thread of order from the tapestry will, by the decision alone, have taken charge of the world. And it is only by such taking charge that he will effect a way to dictate the terms of his own fate. Okay, that's well, that's a scientific impulse as well. That's knowing the more we know, the more we can parse, Mm. the more we can break things apart. Uh, right right yeah. right uh, making uh. the making mm, very interesting yeah there's always a um this is one of the appeals i think just f- from a character standpoint of the judge as you're reading this um you kind of come through reading these things and you're like man this guy's a lot smarter than me like <laughs> like he might be wrong there's an interesting part and in, um where he's uh he's he's sketching in in one of i think it might be webster actually tells the judge like please he basically says don't draw me right don't draw me and they all make fun of them because they they think this guy's being vain the whole crew makes fun of them for being for being vain and judge holden says he's not he's not being vain there's something else going on here he's not it's not vanity and and at some point he explains he explains uh, Judge Holden explains that, like, you're afraid that I am somehow going to capture you by doing this. And uh, I think it's Webster says and I'm sorry, I'm doing this from memory. But Webster says 
I'm not going to I'm not going to try and contest you with words. He says this to Judge Holden. I'm not going to try and contest you to, with words, but it's not like you say. And please don't draw me. And I think you confront when you're dealing with the Holden, you confront this. You're like, I can't argue again. Like, we don't have logical arguments against him necessarily. It's hard to come up with. A, he's 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 going to beat you in court. Uh, and if you're going to stand against him, you might not actually be able to rely on your 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 logic or your rationale, pose a yeah. syllogism that he can't crack, right? It's going to have to be something else. Only save my crusted mug from out your ledger, therefore I'd not have it be shown about perhaps to strangers. Right. And then the company had already begun to call to him his conceit. Mm. And would it perhaps, would there be tar and feathering at its unveiling? Right. And the judge called for amnesty. <laughs> he said that Webster's feelings were of another nature entirely. And he told them the story. And it was this story about an old Waco whose painting he had made. And the man became obsessed and he, he feared that harm would come to it. So the judge accompanied him across a desert and they hid the painting in a cave where for aught he knows it lies there yet. Mm. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, and if we take if we take Webster as standing in for all word cells everywhere because of mm. the name and Webster's dictionary, then of course it stands to reason that the that stand in would not want to be drawn. Well, and true. Uh, There's also mm -hmm. Daniel Webster Little from joke. the Devil and Dan, Dan the Devil and Daniel Webster. It could be both, right? Uh, it's, it, cool it is both. It's, yeah. Well, it's like it's like when he talks about the two Johns uh, who had different names but they were both john's well okay is one uh john of the gospels and the other john of revelations brad and i had a little what is he talking about right mm -hmm. this yeah, is a is. little book that every american of the day would have known this was known as webster's blueback speller it's a spelling book right <laughs> the american spelling book everyone <laughs> a copy of this in his home was the most yeah. famous book in America after the King James Bible. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Right. And they don't spell flavor with a damn you in there, do they? That's right. Right. Yeah. And so because <laughs> this was such a frontier country, there had to be uh, some attempt at regularization. And Webster is enormously important for that. A hundred percent. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, where else do we want to go with this? I mean, there's a ton of directions we can go. I want to um, follow up with something you were just saying. Yeah. The judge, like, who is this motherfucker, right? He's, <laughs> he's running around. He's talking shit. He's massive. He mm -hmm. can, according to the ex-priest, <clears throat> draw with both hands simultaneously, shoot with both hands. He's, quote, either handed as a spider right <laughs> the best fiddler you ever heard i mean the best mm -hmm. he can you know shoot a buck scout a trail ride a horse he, yeah all this he talent. speaks dutch he learned it from yeah. a dutchman yeah. i couldn't have learned it from 10 how about you right it's yeah, i mean right. <laughs> and in addition you to this, you know the judge would have had a killer podcast <laughs> the best podcast a, a podcast to subsume all other pod. We That's would right. now be in his podcast network. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, we might be. Pause. We'd have to pause right now to do manscaped ads. Right. So <laughs> the thing about the judge, in addition to all this other shit, he's constantly, as they make their journey west, he's finding artifacts and drawing them mm -hmm. in his ledger and in his book. Right. The judge all day had made small forays among the rocks of the gorse through which they'd passed. And now at the fire, he spread part of a wagon sheet on the ground and was sorting out his finds and arranging them before him. In his lap, he held the leather ledger book and he took up each piece, flot, or pots heard or tool of bone and deftly sketched it into the book. He sketched with a practiced ease and there was no wrinkling of that bald brow or pursing of those oddly childish lips. His fingers traced the impression of old willow wicker on a piece of pottery clay, and he put them into his book with nice shadings and economy of pencil strokes. 
He is a draftsman as he is other things, well sufficient to the task. Lastly, he set before him the footpiece from a suit of armor hammered out in a shop in Toledo three centuries before, a small steel tapadero frail and shelled with rot. This the judge sketched in profile and in perspective, citing the dimensions in his neat script, making marginal notes. Glanton watched him. When the judge had done, he took up the little foot guard and turned it in his hand and studied it. And then he crushed it into a ball of foil and pitched it into the fire. He gathered up the other artifacts and cast them also into the fire. And he shook out the wagon sheet and folded it away among his possibles together with his notebook. Then he sat with his hands cropped in his lap and he seemed much satisfied with the world, as if his counsel had been sought at its creation. <laughs> so Wonderful. we're going to drive in toward what is the judge a judge of? It's mm -hmm. interesting how often you see him make copies of artifacts of physical things. He has the ledger book then he destroys the original. Mm -hmm. There's a constant right. taking of the artifact, the taking of the real, the taking of the physical, making a representation, a representation mm -hmm. <laughs> of that thing, and then destroying the evidence, destroying the original, replacing the original with a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. And as he says, all books are lies. Right. Well, a false book. Well, he says books lie. Books lie, yeah. Books yeah. lie, right? Not books are lies. That's right. There, there's a difference there. Books for sure. lie. Yeah. And, and then, then the man says, God don't lie. And the judge responds, no, he does not. And these are his words, right? He holds up a rock. Mm -hmm. He speaks in bones and trees. He, spe he speaks in stones and trees, the bones of things. Mm. <laughs> and that's an excellent example of, uh, I don't know if it's foreshadowing, but it's such a sly move because it sets up the major passage in the story that is recounted to the kid, which is for many people, the highlight of the, the book, which is the story of the judge concocting, uh, what is it? Uh, gunpowder out of, the the earth around them in the desert two different mountains sulfur and then the, their own piss in this mm -hmm. kind of unholy communion to create this uh again gunpowder because they're they're drive gunpowder they have none right. left and they're yeah, gonna be they're, they're gonna be hot, massacred hot. yeah they're yeah. under hot pursuit at the moment yeah, yeah. yeah and they're being, gonna be massacred by the uh the apache and there's a I don't have the page in front of me, but there's a moment where they're waiting for the the sun to dry the sort of wicked paste that they've created out of their own mm -hmm. urine. Uh, mm -hmm. And the judge has sort of shoveled it into almost like a like a thick kind of cakey batter. And there's a moment where the a cloud almost covers the sun. And it, it's just this Hitchcock level of of tension being woven there. And you you know that the that the the cloud would not thwart the judge somehow. Like you you know they're gonna they're gonna get what they came for. But he just uh, Cormac or the narrator Cormac writing describes the judge's mixture as a matrix. Yes, a matrix, and that's how he tells you that it's sort of starting to crack, but and 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 create a pattern. But that to me, if we're talking about Gnosticism, another great piece of popular media is quite literally called the matrix about it, which is a Gnostic allegory in any case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Aaron. It's page 138 and 139. And it, back to McCarthy's humor, his humor. He's so fucking funny. And in this scene that is, it's the thing, right? It's the all great text. They have the story within the story, the play within the play, the tale within the tale that, mm -hmm. How came the learned man is the head note. Where did the judge come from? Where Where is this old boy? Right. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of that, Tobin's 
the ex-priest, of course, is telling the story. And then he describes the judge mixing this. And then Tobin says, I didn't know but what we'd be required to bleed in it like Freemasons, but it was not so. He worked it up dry with his hands, and all the while the savages down there on the plains drawn nigh to us. And when I turned back, the judge was standing the great hairless oaf, and he took out his pizzle, and he was pissing into the mixture, pissing with a great vengeance, and one hand aloft, and he cried for us to do likewise. We were half mad anyways, all lined up, Delawares and all, every man saved Glant, and he was a study. We hauled forth our members, and at it we went. And the judge on his knees, kneading the mass with his naked arms, and the piss was splashing about, and he was crying out to us to piss, man, piss for your very souls, for can't you see the redskins yonder, and laughing the while, and working up the great mass in a foul black dough, a devil's batter by the stink of it, and him not a dark bloody paster man himself, I don't suppose, and he pulls out his knife, and he commences to trowel it across the south facing rocks. Was it piss for your very souls? <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> no, I can't uh I can't read as well uh on the fly as Aaron. I don't have this the spirit in me. Maybe I need to uh, you know study some more Gnosticism, but I want to get to this <laughs> word because Brad and I on a back that was that was awesome, Aaron. That's so much mm. fun. Uh I may have we may have to cast you for the theater company at some point for a reading. Uh <laughs> <laughs> but and this is later in that passage we had i would suppose an hour we watched the savages and we watched the judges foul matrix drying on the rocks and we watched a cloud that was making for the sun the etymology of the word matrix uh is obvious it comes from the late middle english in the sense of womb from latin breeding female later womb from mater mother guarantee mm. he's aware of that but it also suggests the this mixture is starting to crack under the heat of the sun mm -hmm. it's just extraordinarily deft and very i don't think very many other writers would come up with that that word for that moment um mm -hmm. pregnant with so much meaning pardon the mm -hmm. pun indeed look at, indeed look at what happens right after that right so after the judge is sitting there, they're all watching. And by the way, the judge does glance up at the cloud. There's a cloud that's making for the sun. They're worried if the cloud covers the sun, won't dry the matrix, no gunpowder, and that the Apaches will find them and it'll be bad fucking news. But finally, that doesn't happen. The judge closes his book and takes up his leather shirt, right? And we heaped it up in the shirt and he commenced to chop it and grind it with his knife. And Captain Glanton, he calls out. Captain Glanton, would you believe it? Captain Glanton, he calls, come charge that swivel bore of yours and let's see what manner of thing we have here. Glanton comes up with his rifle and he scooped his charges full and he charged both barrels and patched two balls and drove them home and capped the piece and made to step to the rim. That was never the judge's way. Down the maw of the thing, he says, and Glanton never questioned it. He went down the pitch of the inner rim to where lay the terminus of that terrible flu, and he held his piece out over it and pointed it straight down and cocked the hammer and fired. You wouldn't hear a sound like it in a long day's ride. It give me the fidgets. He fired both barrels and he looked at us and he looked at the judge. The judge just waved and went on with his grinding. And then he called us all about to fill our horns and flasks. And we did one by one, circling past him like communicants. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh. Yeah, yeah, he's in, he's playing with all of that stuff. And you're, if you're following this Gnostic trajectory, there's a certain idea in Gnosticism uh, where, it's kind of antinatal 
the idea that that why would you bring life into this world if this world is fallen and under the hands of the yeah why would demiurge? you why would you do the work of the demiurge and trap more light in this dimension yeah correct and what do these fellows do they take out their generative organs and mm-hmm. they create out of the earth out of the very world around them out of the very desert around them uh they create this devilish i mean it's literally sulfur is one of the things there that's in use there they create this hellish gunpowder that then they use to to take life out of the world Mm -hmm. in a very similar so it's this inversion of fecundity it's this like Mm anti-life moment yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not to get too freudian but i think it's all pretty obviously there yeah and the judges i mean the judge is a a priest of it in a way Mm -hmm. right correct all of this concludes, right? The kid listens. This is the kid listening to this whole chapter. The kid listening to the ex-priest Tobin tell this story about how came the learned man? How did the judge come to join them? And at the conclusion of this chapter, the kid's only response to this amazing story is this. The ex-priest turned and looked at the kid. And that was the judge, the first I ever saw him. Aye, he's a thing to study. The kid looked at Tobin. What's he a judge of, he said. What's he a judge of? What's he a judge of? Tobin glanced off across the fire. Ah, lad, he said, hush now. The man will hear ye. He's ears like a fox. <laughs> Dangerous question. Yeah, Dang. you're not even supposed to ask, right? Supposed to ask. I think the implication ask. is if you ask, he, he will be the judge of you. And it foreshadows the kid's ultimate fate. It's you don't news. want Yeah, you don't want that guy to he's it's the eye of Sauron. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's bad news. We're, we're driving toward it. Though. We're driving toward what he's judge of a little more. Mm-hmm. So much stuff, though. I mean, you you bring up one passage, and you have these trails that go into philosophy, into theology, theosophy, cosmology, American history. The thing I'm most interested in personally, my my own obsession, right? Is, is that like, oh my gosh, the Bowie knife. This is 1849, 1850. The Bowie knife comes to existence in 1828. And now all these Americans have them, right? I mean, so I'm I'm thinking about a lot of this stuff historically and about the material culture of these men. And what the fuck is a swivel bore, right? <laughs> very rare firearm. It's got two barrels. You can swivel swivel the barrels because it doesn't have a rotating cylinder huh right? okay the, barrels turn. the barrel itself turns interesting the the cartridge a self-contained pistol or rifle cartridge uh Aaron's good Aaron's gonna okay there you go, got a man. bullet a bullet on the pod bullet yeah, on right? the pod so mm-hmm. you didn't have a bullet a charge of yep. powder mm-hmm. now we have brass, they have copper, um, and then some sort of primer, a cap, rather. You didn't have that then. So what you had is you carried rifle and pistol balls, lead balls. You carried black powder and a horn or mostly in a horn, a powder horn. And then you had these small percussion caps, not greatly different than what you probably played with as a kid if you had a cap gun back when kids still went outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what's what's yeah. happened to the world around us? And how <laughs> how could that possibly relate to the the novel Blood Meridian by the great late Cormac McCarthy? I think that's another thing, and I, I don't want to talk over you here, Aaron, but I think it's another thing about this book is that as your student aptly noted, you can feel it around you. And feel- it it's it's an historical novel, but it's about our world right now today, 100 percent Mm-hmm. It's about yeah. our world. I, I there's a piece that oh, you referenced early piece that I had in the Spectator today's Spectator uh, the August issue about Blood Meridian and and what Americans are getting themselves into uh, ordering this book off Amazon right now. 
And I had some lines in the piece I ended up cutting, but it's clear to me that the judge today would be fomenting and profiting from war wherever it existed. I don't see how you could look at American history. I mean, it's a, it's an extraordinarily warlike country. The country has had a great deal of war and visited a lot of war on other on other nations. Uh, there's a there's sort of a strange bloodthirst. I mean, if we if we're going to believe that the Arkans are real, it's a tricky thing. Uh, I don't want to get into politics, but right. if you if you have a sober look at the 20th century. Uh, it was an absolute charnel house. And of course, now we have the, the Oppenheimer film is coming out. Um, what do you, what, what's to be said about how absolutely brutal that century was, uh, both America dishing it out and then participating in trying to stop others from dishing it out. It's this sort of like cycle of evil and evil on a scale that I don't think most people can can really process sitting in our homes podcasting but a book like this can kind of or listening to podcasts uh a book like this can kind of crack the world open a little bit can it give you give you a a way in to to feel something just about i guess the cruel violence of the of the human landscape yeah it's one of the things this book does and, and, and what it feels like to be a body of flesh and blood and breakable bone wandering around this world and how quickly we break, how frail we are, how and how devastating pain, physical pain can be, how devastating it can be, and how much of it there used to be in the lives of people. There's still a great deal of physical pain, great sure. deal of physical pain, but it used to be the existence of Americans in the 19th century, mid 19th century, it was all about pain. And, and if you were Native American, you were Apache or Comanche, oh boy, think about what they lived through. Yeah. Oh, and think about what they weren't able to live through, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like 99% of the Comanche were wiped from the face of the earth. Think about that. 99% of an entire people, right? So we're talking about a brutality that's really difficult to imagine scrolling TikTok. Yeah. Well, and this is, I, and I, I've stepped away for a moment, so I apologize. I don't know. When I, I'm sorry. When I scroll TikTok, I do get into a homicidal rage. Yeah. <laughs> An indiscriminate gang yeah. gang, yum yeah. yum gang yeah. gang, oh, homicidal stop rage. Stop. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> had to be done. I would rather read about a, a herd of you know of you'd rather you'd rather coming read, over the yeah, you'd rather read about a tree of dead babies, yeah, which is one of which is that. one of the haunt the most haunting images in all of all of it literature. Is. It is. I mean, we've got Bosch, we've got Dante, we've got Milton, we have Shakespeare, mm -hmm. we have the Bible, we have uh John Ford, we've got uh, mm -hmm. The Searchers. We've got uh, Ingmar Bergman, uh, The Seventh Seal. I mean, this thing just sets off. It's an absolute cacophony in my uh, intertextual yeah. media hypersaturated brain when I'm reading this. It's such a joy. Yeah. Go on, Brad. Well, and, and 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 one of, I mean, we talk about the judge, and of course, the judge is the uh, one of the most sort of appealing from a literary standpoint aspects of the story. But to me, the landscape itself plays this role that is um almost unmatched elsewhere in literature and it's constantly it you will hear people refer to a book and be like oh the the environment is like a character but here it really it really sort of is and this is what was interesting about your spectator your recent spectator piece Aaron was that the the art for it and I don't know who did that but the art for it was the judge's head as the sun um, which is kind of Gnostic in and of itself, right? Really, you know, if the land is demonic itself, but, but you feel there is, you're in contest with the environment. It's beautiful, but it will also take your life at a moment's notice. And they're constantly passing through very alien territory that is, 
has characteristics that I think if you haven't been outside and touched grass in a while, you might not realize are even part of what the earth can be like. You know, there's a there's a passage I was reading where they're re- they're 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 riding in the heat off of this rock wall is so intense they have to like turn their head away from it because it's just such the, the heat radiating off of it is is basically burning them. Um, there's at one point somebody gets picked up by like a little dust devil, uh, or they find somebody who'd been picked up by a dust devil, I believe. Um, there's that beautiful bit where they're kind of, they're going down through into some like dry riverbed or something. And a bear grabs one of the Delaware, like a storybook beast. Um, and his compatriot his Delaware compatriots track try to track it for several days but have no luck actually finding after actually finding him um it, it's just like at any moment the landscape can just open up and any number of horrors will be <laughs> voiced upon you I yeah. want to read just that paragraph because oh, it's, it's so good because we've we've talked about like the, the terror the horror the brutality but and the humor there's another side to this and the side that side is the insanely beautiful sublime prose that echoes the King James Bible Shakespeare Melville that passages they rode on into the mountains and their way took them through high pine forests wind in the trees lonely bird calls the shoeless mule slaloming through the dry grass and pine needles in the blue coolies on the north slopes, narrow tailings of old snow. They rode up switchbacks through a lonely aspen wood where the fallen leaves lay like golden disklets in the damp black trail. The leaves shifted in a million spangles down the pale corridors. And Glanton took one and turned it like a tiny fan by its stem and held it and let it fall and its perfection was not lost on him. They rode through a narrow draw where the leaves were shingled up in ice and they crossed a high saddle at sunset where wild doves were rocketing down the wind and passing through the gap a few feet off the ground, veering wildly among the ponies and dropping off down into the blue gulf below. They rode on into a dark fir forest, the little Spanish ponies sucking the thin air. And just at dusk, as Glanton's horse was clambering over a fallen log, a lean blonde bear rose up out of the swale on the far side where it had been feeding and looked down at them with dim pig's eyes. That's so good. (laughs) <laughs> so good i mean yeah it's you're talking about beautiful nature uh, on par with the best of the romantic poets and then it's punctuated by a a, a monster being attacked by a monster yeah it, it reminds yeah. me of one of my one of my favorite artists uh Werner herzog mm. the, it has a, he has a similar sensibility where he can appreciate pastoral nature he can represent it and show it to you in a way that makes you kind of gasp for breath. Uh, but then he turns the screw and he knows, and he even says that it's just cruel. It's just nature. Yeah. It's just a, a carnival of murder. It's a symphony See, of murder. I'm from a school of thought that you can't actually fully appreciate that beauty unless you can reckon with the other side of it. Unless Boy, you that's... recognize that it will murder you at a moment's notice. <laughs> it, yeah, it's almost like you're a blood meridian respecter, yeah, Brad. Right. I mean, that you could you could say that's like, what's it about? What's this book yeah. about? It's about that thing Brad just described mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in part. Can I ask you guys about something? This is this is a blood meridian thought. And I think about this a lot when I read the book. And I was talking about Philip Meyer the other day. Every time I've seriously injured myself. Like like bad hospital injury shit. Right as it was happening, the first thought in my head is the thought of a child if his father like accidentally dropped him. Mm. And that thought is like, oh my gosh, this can happen. My life is not a video game. Mm. My life is not is not on rails, not on skids. There's no mm. bumpers. 
right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've told the story. It's not a big deal. I had a, I had a spinal injury in my squat rack in May of 2021, broke my back, had to have emergency spinal surgery. And it was a lot of pain as it was happening. As I hit the ground under uh, a loaded barbell, I felt betrayed. I felt betrayed by the universe. Right. Right. Like, because we walk through our lives and we have this, I have this sense that, that there's somebody I'm protected from danger in some way. Mm -hmm. I just have that sense of being protected. And mm -hmm. of course that's an illusion. It's not real. Now, maybe without that, we wouldn't be able to do anything. And maybe right. people who have really terrible anxiety are closer to the truth that there's nothing keeping you from falling in the shower. Right. Right. There's nothing keeping you from choking on your dinner tonight. People, yeah. the emergency rooms are full of dead people who die. I'll, I'll, die. I'll tell you something as a parent of young children. Uh, and of course, the way this book begins is with the sentence, see the child. Yeah. I'm co-parenting. I mean, I'm a parent with uh, another parent, you know, another parent uh, of a soon to be three year old who's a runner. And he he will run into the street if we don't hold his hand. And that is right. a very similar feeling to what you're describing uh Aaron where you're you think uh oh my god there is there's nothing stopping him he has no impulse control mm -hmm. uh he, he's like Brad was in grad school yeah that's right <laughs> uh he, he he can't control himself in workshop but but you know what I'm saying like it's just pandemonium for this this child see the mm -hmm. child and and he'll turn a corner and we know now and we do our very best but every parent has had that that heart drop where you go, Oh my God, I'm responsible for this right. to the yeah. nth. Yeah. And nobody yeah. else will step. Nobody else will step in. Yeah. Uh, a car will I, run over your child. Yeah. Like, uh, like nothing. Yeah. I had a, I have a close friend who has a, a son similar, very similar age. And when he was about tot getting into toddler age, he described him as it's like having a clown that's constantly trying to kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> it's like hilarious but he will literally die if you stop paying attention for 30 seconds yeah <laughs> I, I uh i grew up i grew up on a cattle ranch was raised by my grandparents and i wanted to do everything with my granddad and mm. he's still with us great guy there's no reason why wow. you wouldn't want to do everything with him but so he would go out i don't know if people that aren't raised in the country know about these so we had a big ford tractor and to cut the grass uh, like around the property. We had a, tons of acres. Um, you have a thing you attach called a brush hogger, right? Which is it's like a massive mower you drag with a tractor, right? The blade is maybe five feet long on some of these massive, massive piece of machinery, right? And so I would want to, the fun thing to do is to sit uh, on top of one of the fenders above the big tires, right? just be right there. It's just a kid would want to do that, right? My granddad, no. And so what he would do, he, we had a front end loader on this tractor. He tied a rope and he would seat me right in front of the steering wheel, right in front of him. No way I could fall. There's no falling off. There's nothing to fall onto except backwards to him or not. You know, there's, I'm, it's fine, right? It's totally, and I have a little rope to hold onto and I would beg him to be on the fender. He'd go, no. And one of his friends had a son, five years old, put him on the fender, brush hogging. The boy fell off backwards and was completely mutilated instantly mm -hmm. by a brush hogger, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You think about the kind of horror a lot of people lived with on, on farms and ranches and across the country. And that is something that is quite foreign to us in 2023 my uh great grandfather on my mother's side uh left i believe eight children behind after a gruesome farm accident where he was run over by a tiller basically had his oh. guts spilled out and oh. my grandma lived with that you know the and she was a stern woman there wasn't a lot of uh, warmth from from that right. side but you hear stories like that and you begin to understand wow i'm griping about nothing i it's, should it's, i mean mm -hmm. yeah. 
this thing is still this thing is still happening. I mean, I know about a guy three or four years ago. I don't know all the details of the story, but basically his working on a farm, his coat got caught up in some kind of axle or another. Again, I don't have all the details, but basically it grabbed his coat and it twisted it and twisted it and twisted it and Oof. crushed him inside of his jacket. Whoa. Yeah. So I guess this is a long way of saying yeah. anyway. read Blood Meridian. <laughs> uh, and it, 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 <laughs> but it will. It, it provokes these kind of conversations. I mean, we're, well, we're getting into we're, we're going to come up for an hour here. And yeah, go, yeah. go on, Brett. Well, on. let me tell you just like one thing I think about a lot in in in. A lot of this book to me is weird. My memory of it, having read it a number of times, I feel like I remember most of it, but I don't always remember the sequence of events, if that makes sense. Like, I don't always remember what leads into the next thing, but I do recall fairly early on the the um, the uh, ambush that the kid survives where the kid and I believe one other guy are the only people who survive and he has an arrow in his leg. Um Yes. And honestly, anytime I'm dealing with some even minor endurance thing, like I have some minor injury, but I got to do something anyway, that moment comes to my mind of just a arrow in your leg, trying to make it across the desert. Don't really even know where you're going. It's thirsty, hot, bleeding, infected. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's like a constant note in my head for whatever reason. I would rather There's be a shot. With a high caliber, I'd rather be shot with a high velocity rifle and any pistol round. Yeah. Than than hit with an arrow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's this, there's this there's a scene where uh, where the kid volunteers, and then this will get us on to the sexuality or like sex in this book, which is Ooh. not pleasant. Which is not pleasant. Um, but right. there's a lot of like pederasty. There's a lot of the the sex is not a nice positive thing in this book but there's Never. that this there's a scene uh another freudian type thing where uh, the kid volunteers to help push the arrow through uh the fellows do you recall the character who it is yes david brown brown push the arrow through his leg the arrow comes out whole on the other side and he's pleased about that because it means he's not going to have a part of the arrow lodged in his whatever his thigh wherever it's set uh and then then the old man comes over and says something kind of uncanny to to the kid Aaron you're nodding what is it that he says roughly fool don't you know he'd have taken you with him he'd have taken you lad like a bride to the altar does he mean to his tent what is he talking death. about there yeah to death Brown oh, is such physical pain that if that hadn't worked out, that Brown might have just torn his throat out. Right. Oh, whoa. And, and there's that. But then there's also just the generally taking care of somebody who can't hold their own weight. It's like rescuing a swimmer, right? Mm. Like you're mm -hmm. in this environment where the stakes are incredibly high. The wrong step in any direction can lead to you dying. This guy doesn't give a shit about you living. He is in such agony that he only cares about himself, as is human nature. It's not even a judgment on Brown, necessarily. That's just yeah. how it is to be a human being. He yeah, talks about him. They say that in trying to rescue swimmers. It's like literally like, don't. Yeah, well, yeah, unless yeah, you definitely. unless you know what you're doing, unless you're, unless you, you know what you're doing or you've training. got, you know, life preservers mm -hmm. or whatever. But like, yeah, yeah. I love um, that bit. What was I going to say about the... I lost it. I'll come back to it. Go ahead. Well, he describes uh, Brown after the arrow is pulled out, uh, making like a female gesture on the on the uh, the ground. Okay. So evocative. Lurid. A lurid. A lurid female. Yeah. And, so you, and your <laughs> mind just creates it in your mind. It's so uh, masterful. Uh, it's sort of awful, too. There's the thinking about sex and Blood Meridian, the just how uh, there's a point where there's a massacre being described or happening and talks about one of the these run of the mill massacres. One of these, one of these massacres. <laughs> it talks about, I think it's. I think it's the Apache that talks about them like sodomizing the dying soldiers. I mean, and you're just reading this and going, damn, 
<laughs> like, yeah. whoa. Uh, like, okay, there's a tree of dead babies. Now we have some, you know, murderous sodomy. I mean, it's 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 a deeply yeah. Anyway, that's the kind of book it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're dying, do you want someone there who cares about you and, and can speak words of comfort and remembrance? Or do you want the Comanches who will sodomize oh. you with loud cries to their fellows? Right. Yeah. I want, I, want, I want to be comforted a little bit. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I would take even nothing at all. Uh, a sure. <laughs> sure. Just let me let it happen. Right. Mean, yeah, yeah. I'll go into it by myself if it's between that and the apat and being sodomized. Yeah. That's the that's the line of the podcast, right? I would take nothing at all. That's like <laughs> it's almost like, like that's such a McCarthy line. I would take nothing at all. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 a really right. horrific passage. It's one of those passages in a novel where you pause and maybe you go back over it again and go, "Did I read that right? Mm-hmm. Oh, I read that right. Mm-hmm. Wow." Damn. I mean, and this it, there's not a punch pulled in this novel. No. Uh and it's not for the faint of heart either. Uh and yet it is a, it, and yet it is somehow kind of fun to read. It's yeah. well, I find it, See, I yeah. and it, maybe this is my sort of nature when pe- I don't have difficulty reading it because of the darkness or the violence or any of that. Like it doesn't put me off. I and and, and I'm I'm not even somebody who seeks that necessarily. Like, for instance, I don't like like body horror films. Like, I just don't get it, honestly. Like, but for whatever reason, within Blood Meridian, it doesn't it it unnerves me. But I find that unnerving somehow satisfying. The fact that I'm my jimmies have been rustled. I think where I come down on it is that well, we talked a lot about Disney lately on the pod. Mm-hmm on mm-hmm. old art of darkness podcast yeah. and yeah. uh when you it's a good show by the you way grow up feeling yeah i've heard that you grow up feeling uh like you've been lied to and i think i think all children are you're lied to somewhat as a child you have to be and mm-hmm. you you know they have to you know whatever you can't just come to a five-year-old and go santa isn't real we're not even sure about god good luck kid right <laughs> like you, you know you have to sort of nudge people along but there's a there's a certain point where you like Disney, as we've pointed out, has sort of taken over the zeitgeist, takes over huge chunks of the zeitgeist, makes yeah. everything cute and nice, deracinates yeah. the German and Celtic folk tales, takes all the teeth and out all the blood out of everything, mm-hmm. and controls sports ball, and that's the world that you're presented with. And the most dangerous you might get would be taking money maybe you have earmarked for your kid and parlaying it on the NBA finals and oh I'm such a <laughs> bad boy you know mm-hmm. or you can read Blood Meridian and as Bukowski said you could have the the mouse kicked right the fuck out of your head which is what a book like this does mm-hmm. and it isn't a fetish object it does it in a way that connects it to all of these very meaningful things that we've already noted uh, but also stands firm, firmly stands on its own. And so for me, Brad, when I when I encounter that justified violence in great works of art, mm-hmm. it just it, it reminds me of reality such yeah. as it is. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and there's no there's no Mickey Mouse. There's no Donald Duck. And, and uh, let's face it. History has been a charnel house. Just like the 20th, but, 20th century alone. I mean, yeah. the 20th century is just like in terms of pure numbers. Yeah. No worse. No worse century in terms of like horrific death at scale. Well, uh, and I'm reading I'm I'm and maybe it's slightly tease. I am preparing the John Milton episode of Art of Darkness. And during John Milton's lifetime, there were two plagues. One wiped out a sixth of London and another wiped out, I believe, a eighth of the Lunt population of London. And then the next year, the entire city burned to the ground. Was okay. it 1660? <laughs> was it 1666? That was the 1666 Great Fire of 1666. So you, these things are that is what life is. All of this stuff that we've managed to ho- thank God we've managed to cobble together some convenience and comfort and safety. But like 
you can only maintain that if you're aware of how dangerous it is just outside of it, right? Because otherwise you're going to start to get sloppy. You're going to start, yes. well, it's and, not really that dangerous, you know? Right. And there, that's that edifying, <laughs> cathartic thing that comes from work mm-hmm. of art like this mm-hmm. for real. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, do you want to grace us with any, uh, any, anything from the spectator article that oh, dropped yeah, today or, great. or, or from your obit that, that you, that you wrote because you were, you're one of the people that they, they tapped when they tapped when, when it happened. And yeah, I know, I, I, oh my God. I mean, it, it, that, that was a terrible day. We were all, I, I know. It, was, it messed me up. I, uh, I found out about it when, um, an editor there messaged me and I picked up my phone and it said, do you want to write McCarthy's obituary? And I'm like, like when he dies someday. And then I was like, Oh my gosh. Right. And so I, oh. I Googled real quick and I was like, and I like, he was so quick on it that, I mean, he couldn't have been, it would had just been announced. Like there was, I, I, when I first Googled, there was, there were no articles. I had to go to Twitter because Twitter's a little quicker sometimes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not quicker we, with all the details, but it's quicker sometimes with the like, yeah, 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 it'll, 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 it'll if you want to destroy your career, no place will yeah. do it quicker. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's the best place to set yourself on fire without having to get gasoline or a match. Um, we're, are we, are we, are you getting ready to land us? Because I have a place to go if we're, are, are sure. you, are you, were you, I, just, Kevin, were you thinking about landing the plane? Are you thinking toward that? I I think if we go for another half hour on this and then come back for the after dark, that'll be a good amount of time. But I'm wide there, open. I there is no, one. There is one I, question I want to talk about mm-hmm. that we haven't talked about. Indeed. Um, I'll let, I I want to get to what the judge is a judge of, yeah, but I don't do know if that should come before or after Brad's. Brad's no, Brad. let's 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 do it because well, well, my question and I'll uh, free wheel in here. Um, I want to know who the narrator is. I want to know who the judge is, but I want to know who the narrator is. And maybe we can, maybe there's a way to segue from the, who the judge is to who the narrator is. I think these things are linked. I think think so too. That's my, that's my, that's my intuition, but I don't know if I have been able to articulate it yet. So the judge is this old boy who is gathering these artifacts and then facing the originals, destroying the originals there's a, a passage where the gang is riding along a rock wall and there are basically cave paintings, but they're, they're etchings along the wall. And the judge rides along and he copies them in his book. And then he stops his horse and gets a piece of rock and etches them away. He erases the original. So things and that he, he, think- ta- he, he takes one of them too, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, copies them down, copies down, makes his representation, and then effaces okay. the original. There's no record. This thing never happened. The art that these people made never happened. It's gone. Yeah, yeah. So, toward the end of the book, the gang goes busto. The kid is shot, as you said, with an arrow. They get to San Diego, and the kid goes to a doctor and uh, to have the arrow removed. The doctor says, you don't need to be drunk. We have spirits of ether. Well, the kid's dumb enough to to like take the spirits of ether and he has ether dreams. I was given ether when I was a little kid for a surgery. I, they should have just shot me in the face. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's insane, but yeah. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying. Like I was nine, I cut this finger off, they reattached it, but I was lying there, they were getting ready to do surgery, and all I could think about in my nine-year-old brain is they're about to give me a shot. I don't want to get a shot. I'm scared of a shot. Mm -hmm. So I said, do you guys have to give me the shot? And this satanic anesthesiologist said, no. The Miltonic anesthesiologist, you're seven foot tall. He goes, we can give you ether, ether, ether. And I'm like, okay. And I was like, is it bad? And he goes, it smells like mommy's perfume. I was like, okay. And so then they put the mask on me and I started breathing. I was like, this kind of smells weird. And then what I saw was the room turn upside down, right? 
And I, and I started panicking. I tried to pull off the mask and the man said, you got to breathe deep, but we'll give you the shot. So nice guy gone. Mm-hmm. Nice guy gone. Right? So that was my ether experience. Yeah. Oof. Um, Oof. Now the narrator tells us as the kid is waking up from the anesthesia in that sleep and in sleeps to follow the judge did visit who would come other a great shambling mute, silent and serene. And here's a good warning for us with what we've been doing right now. Mm-hmm. Whatever his antecedents, he was something wholly other than their sum, nor was their system by which to divide him back into his origins would not go. Whoever would seek out his history through what unraveling of loins and ledger books must stand at last darkened and dumb at the shore of a void without terminus or origin, and whatever science he might bring to bear upon the dusty primal matter blowing down of the millennia will discover no trace of any ultimate atavistic egg by which to reckon is commencing. In the white and empty room, he stood in his bespoken suit with his hat in his hand, and he peered down with his small and lashless pig's eyes, wherein this child, just 16 years on earth, could read whole bodies of decisions not accountable to the courts of men. And he saw his own name, which nowhere else could he have ciphered out at all, logged into the records as a thing already accomplished. In his delirium, he ransacked the linens of his pallet for arms, but there were none. The judge smiled. The fool was no longer there, but another man. And this other man he could never see in his entirety, but he seemed an artisan and a worker in metal. The judge enshadowed him where he crouched at his trade, but he was a cold forger, literally a counterfeiter, but he was mm-hmm. a cold forger who worked with hammer and die, perhaps under some indictment and an exile from men's fires, hammering out like his own conjectural destiny all through the night of his becoming some coinage for a dawn that would not be. It is this false moneyer with his gravers and burins who seeks favor with the judge, and he is at contriving from cold slag, brute in the crucible, a face that will pass, an image that will render this residual specie current in the markets where men barter. Of this is the judge, judge, and the night does not end. So what the hell does all that mean? So there was no national currency in the United States before 1862 when Lincoln said, listen, we need all these things to unify us. One of those things is money. Yeah. Sorry, one second. One second. This dumb question. What year is this happening in Blood Marie? And I know roughly, but. This is 1850 now. Okay, right? okay. 1849, 1850 for most of the book. And at the very end, we skip forward to 1878. Right, okay. But, so until 1862, or yeah, until 1862, there was no currency. If you wanted if you wanted to carry money around with you and you didn't want to carry gold or silver, you know, the coins, there were like double eagle coins minted, right? Mm-hmm. That was called uh, specie. Any coin, uh, you know, gold coin, silver coin, those are specie, currency or notes. Um, The notes that were circulated were notes printed by banks that were localized. So there might be a $20 uh, note printed by a bank in Georgia. And in that town, and maybe even in Georgia, people will accept that. But if you want to go to New Orleans, you may get to New Orleans and they say, fuck you and your right. Georgia note, right? Yeah. And so there's no national currency. Mostly what people did in order to um, buy and sell is they wrote IOUs. And those IOUs were then traded 
two, three, four, five more times. So a man's name was his worth. So if I'm in a community and people know me, oh, he's he's a butcher. He always pays his bills. I know him. I know his family. I know him for, you know, blah, 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 blah. But yeah, if I write you an IOU, I know where to find you. I believe you will discharge your debt. All right. Contrary wise, if I say, Brad Kelly, you are a black guard and, uh, you know, whatever. Right. An old time insult. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Let me, I, I'm going to look up uh, 19th century American insults for the Irish. I'll dude. be right back. Oh, just you kidding. Son of yeah, a I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. no, like, you dude, son of a the bitch, internet. Grout yeah. couchman, you goddamn. <laughs> Right. That's right. All that stuff. What I'm doing is I'm literally devaluing your currency. Mm. If I issue, if I issue that those insults and say he's a he's a whoremonger and a mm. profligate and a blackguard, people mm. are like, I don't know about his currency. This is why there were duels in the Southern United States. Men didn't fight for their honor; they fought for their cash. Wow, they fought for the worth of their notes, right? That this is is always missed. Like, oh, Southern men in their honor. Oh, yeah, Southern men have honor, of course. But you're fighting for your ability to write an IOU and have accepted a discharge does, right? Yeah, and so, we turn that into like credit score or something. That's right, 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 right. right. But thank, thank God we have no uh, social credit system in the United States. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so, so how do you, you know? Currency is really interesting because if you make a coin, it has to have the backing of something, a, an institution, a government, right? So that specie or that note will be rendered current in the markets where men barter. In order to be currency, and currency is a note that must be accepted, legal tender means a bill has to be accepted by vendors. If you walk into a place and they say no cash taken, you can say, fuck yourself. This is the United States. Under U.S. law, you are required to take this bill to discharge a debt. You I'm going to do that. Son of a bitch, black garden fucker. <laughs> I'm going to pay ca- I'm paying cash for this first edition copy of it. <laughs> fucking tender. Yeah, this yeah. isn't Tinder, the app. This is legal tender, the <laughs> tender. Uh-huh. Okay, so, Woo! so the judge, that was a hell of a footnote. Yeah. Thank you. The judge is in shadowing this counterfeiter, this cold forger <laughs> in the kid's dream, right? And this man, man is working with hammer and dies with the tools of his trade. Gravers and burns are more tools that, that coiners will use to make coins. Mm-hmm. And the narrator says, you know, perhaps he's an exile from men's fires. And he's hammering out like his own conjectural destiny, some coinage for a dawn that would not be. It's this false mon- moneyer with his gravers and burns who seeks favor with the judge. Mm. And he, the, the false moneyer, the counterfeiter, this, this forger, is at contriving from cold slag, the cold metal. A face that will pass, right? Just like we have Washington's face on a coin or Lincoln's face on a coin or Grant's, et cetera, et cetera. You got to find a face that will pass, an Mm. image that will render this residual specie current in the markets where this, where of this is the judge judge. The judge is the judge of representation. The judge is the judge of the process by which the counterfeit replaces the real. Holy so shit. just as the judge right. collapses a piece of Spanish armor and destroys it, just as he wipes out the, the, the drawings, the etchings by the native people, all we have is the judge's copy. All what? we have is he, the, the judge is the narrator. Of course. Well, not the narr- I don't think I think it's a little different, right? So here's here's okay. the distinction. Wait, real quick, hang on. You're on a roll. The judge, what does the judge do to that fellow? He grabs him by the head in the bar right. fight and until his head is misshapen. So That's that right. comes back to the coin, doesn't it? A head that yeah, will pass. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
face that will pass. Like, you know, what mm. kind of face can this counterfeiter put on this coin to fool people, right? The judge who who destroys the real and replaces it with simulacrum, with simulation, with a counterfeit. And it counterfeits so real, no one can tell the difference. I mean, counterfeiting is very interesting. And hey. during the Civil War, Confederate counterfeiters were captured because the notes they printed were too good. <laughs> They're better than the real. Confederate currency was so kicked in hmm. and so fake looking. The real shit looked fake, but the hmm. counterfeit shit looked real. Wow. Well, you can't exist in a world like that. You have to hang those motherfuckers. Right. 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 You can, you, man, if you start fucking with people's money, right? Yeah. One thing yeah. Americans will not. I, listen, them. listen, I live in I live in the Twin Cities of Minnesota and I don't want to get political, but the, the business with uh, Mr. Floyd kicked off over a counterfeit bill. It did. That is an amazing thing. Right. So this is something that is still policed today. Oh, yeah. By the still Secret police. Service, no less. By, by an entire service. different, yeah, in, weirdly, but there there is something here, and, and this is this is this is like fresh. To, this is to some degree fresh territory for me. There is something about I in the the last. I guess it's a, the epilogue. I don't think it's actually called the epilogue. There is the in the encroachment of modernity with the fence posts and we're, we're, we're coming into a new age of, uh, 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 industrialism. And there is something about now I'm starting to think like something about the judge, the world is going to become fake from here on out. We're going to transverse past the desert of the real into a world of, of manufacture and artifice and synthesis. And the judge is, going to be uh what does he call himself Cesarin? Cesar yeah, know how to pronounce Cesar it. he's going to be he's like so, we're getting into like baudrillard territory like the whole world is going to be fake but if you can establish something that can you can get a foothold on in that fakeness you can be king in some way this is fast this is amazing well and I'm always asking Americans. I'm a, I love American history from 76, 1776 to 1876. Those hundred years are what I'm interested in. I don't care what happens after that. I'm not interested <laughs> in any politician after Grant. In, 17, <laughs> in 1876, barbed wire was run. The West was fenced off. The West is over. The Comanche are forced onto the reservations. The Sioux go into the reservations. Wild Bill Hickok is shot. It's all fucking over. It's mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything after 1876 doesn't take place. We're all representations of the judge for all I care. But, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I ask people, have you, oh, do you, uh, do you like Westerns? Oh, I fucking love Unforgiven. I love this. I love yeah. that. It's like, you ever, have you read a history? Have you read uh, Fahrenbach's Lone Star History of Texas? No. Mm -hmm. Have you read a history of the American Southwest? No. Have you ever mm -hmm. read a history of Arizona or Mexico in the 19th century? Hell no. No. I was like, have you read Blood Meridian? Hell yeah. 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 McCarthy has taken the history of the Southwest and he's created a counterfeit. <laughs> so you have to ask if you're holding yeah. this book, if you have this book, and if you've read this book and love this book, have you read a history of the American Southwest? Have you read a history of the pursuit of the Apache and the annihilation of the Comanche and then have you read or have you read Car McCarthy's Counterfeit? Right. And uh, the judge is the is the one who judges whether the, the thing can pass, whether the counterfeit can pass as real currency. So people, I've had students at this point go, oh, Cormac McCarthy is the judge. No, 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 no. Cormac McCarthy is the cold forger. Cormac McCarthy mm -hmm. is the counterfeiter in this analogy. Mm -hmm. He's a blind man hammering, 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 trying to please the judge, mm -hmm. seeking favor with the judge, mm -hmm. trying to create a counterfeit that can be passed as the real. Yeah, damn. <laughs> Who is the narrator? Well, there's certain things we can say about him, right? 
He is a man not of our world, and by our world, I mean 1985 world. He is a man of that world. Mm. He's a man who uses racial slurs. Not I'm not talking about the, the slurs that are in the dialogue. I'm talking about he will use it in the text and in the head notes. Yeah. And in the head notes. He so a lot of people think, well, a first person narrator, I get my I can get my head around how Humbert Humbert or Merceau or um, Holden Caulfield is not the same as as their authors, right? I can wrap my head around that. But if you use third person, there's this tendency of people to think, oh, a third person narrator is the author. Well, no, not at all. The third person narrator is a constructed voice, just as a first person is. Mm -hmm. All third person narrators are actually first person. They just don't say I, right? Yeah. So yes, but, 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 but this narrator does on, on page one. I looked for blackness, holes in the heaven. It does not happen frequently after that. No, I think that might be the only time that but, is but that, that, a but clue. That, plays, that, that talks right into Aaron's, uh, what the point Aaron's making is that any third person voice is a constructed voice. I mean, I write in third person and, you know, not that I'm Cormac McCarthy, but yes, it's a made up, it's a perspective that is not mine, but sort of is, right? There, it's, yeah. It's, I mean, it would... Is is it is it the kid or is it the father or is it no okay all right I don't well think so. I, 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 yeah. I want to know what Aaron thinks. If you're talking about Night of Your Birth thirty three, the Leonids they were called God, how the stars did fall. That's the father. That ah, ah, right? I see. Okay, yeah, right. right. So that's dialogue. Okay, or, right. that's all right. yeah. It's weird because like that's where McCarthy's refusal to use quotation marks. Is, uh, no, of course. No, it's fine. I, mean, I appreciate you helping me with my reading yeah, of it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he. Oh, I see. Of course. I mean, it's set up. He quotes from poets, and so the the drunken father is telling the son of his the night of but his it's birth. Interesting. Mm -hmm. it, the the narr. I think we get to something really important there. The narrator could very well be a person like the kid's father, a school teacher, someone who is of this world and is watching these men and almost never, almost never enters the heads of the characters, almost never uses the word feel or thought, mm -hmm. right? The, mm -hmm. the interior dimension is 98% absent. There are a few instances toward the end of the book, the last act, where you'll have you have little shadings with the kid who becomes the man but for the most part there is no internality we are the narrator is watching these men and reporting what these guys do and the physical sensations mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. I see. I well, and tell me, tell me if this this makes any sense. And I don't know if I've ever articulated this. My feeling is that the narrator though it you could perhaps embody it isn't a character that's participating in the story but is the same narrator of uh the Johnny Appleseed story and the any number of american legends who's the narrator of those right it's right. sort of all right. of us kind of in a way right. right that's the way that i think of it it's it's and and does that call into question whether this stuff actually happened absolutely <laughs> Right, right. Well, I think it's it's important to, to see. I, I I hate to emphasize this point again. I'm doing it for myself. Mm -hmm. um, it was so important for me to understand, oh, this is not narrated from 1985 looking back. It's not that McCarthy created a narrator who looks back at this time from the distance of more than 100 years. McCarthy mm -hmm. creates a narrator who from the very first sentence is present at, you know, in the spirit of, of narration as if he's hovering mm -hmm. and commands, see the child. Mm -hmm. He is pale and thin, right? That So he is of this world, of these people. He doesn't make many judgments, but he makes some. He makes some. When there's, a when, there, there's a distinct one I remember where they're um, they're camping out and there are bats and it just says they were afraid. And that one really rings for me. There, there's a few others, but that's the one that really like um, 
that's it's powerful he mccarthy from is saving up for these handful of moments that's right yeah to get the absolute most out of them that he possibly can there's a passage where glanton performs what's basically a mercy killing which is strange he kills a woman in a park Mm -hmm. right he shoots her and but before he does that he does something very unglanton he distracts her he 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 like gets her attention and he points and when she turns he shoots her and and what the narrator says is the explosion filled all that sad little park well mm. sad there's nothing in in the narrator the narrator doesn't usually make comments like that the narrator doesn't tell us something sad we fucking know the whole book. We know. <laughs> we know it. Yeah. yeah, this is fucking bloody as fuck, and people are yeah. losing it, right? So yeah. the narrator really um, doesn't often do that, right? And so you have little things like that. If you have evaluations, they come from the characters. Right. It's right. something, I mean, it taught me studying this book as someone trying to write fiction in my mid 20s, taught me how to begin to create characters on the page that could be known to a reader purely through what could be dramatized, right? right. Through what they say, what they do, their appearance, right? And and to really locate that drama in the physical and the noble. Now, of course, one of the great things about fiction is that you can enter as a writer, you can enter that internal interior space yeah. And, you know, and do it beautifully and all this other stuff. But I felt like when I was starting, I wouldn't say anyone else has to be this way. I wanted to capture the external drama first. Yeah. I, I felt like I had to nail that. Um, and McCarthy- I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm exactly with you. This is the big thing I learned from McCarthy was was uh, dramatic third person. And not that I would go as hardcore or even try to go as hardcore as I am about keeping outside of the character's head. But what it drove home to me was like, if you're going to go into the character's head, it better be fucking worth it. That's right. right. Like you can't just go in there and say, well, he then he thought this thing that you could have dramatized it better. Right. You better do something that can't be done in cinema, that can't That's be right. done in, in, in any other art form except for fiction. Well, I, I agree with that. And, and Kevin, as a dramatist, as a stage dramatist, yeah. um, you know, there are ways of cheating that. And the chorus is a way of cheating that, mm-hmm. right? But for the most part, I mean, if we're in the audience, we're watching a play, we know what's going on because we see the, those characters on stage doing things and saying things, right? We see the exterior and the external. We're not, gra- for the most part, we're not granted access to their minds. Unless you do the soliloquy. Right. Unless you do the chorus. I mean, you can, it's not cheating, but you can do something else. There are devices, though. You can make characters talk to them. You know, there are ways of getting, doing it. But That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, who yeah. is the narrator? Well, <laughs> yeah, we don't know exactly, but there are things we can say. There are things we do know. We know who it's not. We know it's not a person of 1980s. We know it's not a, a person isn't someone who entered the 20th century. Right. And this is a person that's close to these events. Yeah. And you know, that's on diction, if nothing else. Yeah. Yes. The sense the, of humor. yes. Yeah. Since you were the syntax, the diction, though, of course, mm-hmm. of course, as he's McCarthy, he has learned all the lessons of modernism, all the lessons of irony. And, and I mean, I, people talk about it as a postmodern Western. I mean, sometimes those terms don't make a lot of sense to me. And they don't seem particularly useful. I, I see McCarthy as, as carrying on the project of modernism. He, he seems to have learned all his lessons, yeah. post Melville and Twain from Hemingway and Faulkner um, and T.S. Eliot. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Big time. Yeah, that I, I haven't really heard it too many people try to describe it as a postmodern western i do agree with you that it's not a super useful um way of looking at it um you know because partially because every time i hear somebody actually lay out what postmodernism is as a literary style it's either very narrow and applicable to you know some dozens of writers or it's they're talking about something that people have been doing for hundreds of years 
It's like they'll, they'll describe something and be like, yeah, but that's in Don Quixote. So what do you like? What do you mean postmodern? That's right. right? Well, yeah. That's, well, that, that I mean, the novel starts in that metafictional space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it the, does. The early 17th century. So, yeah. Yeah. The meta and then almost all the first English novels after Robinson Crusoe, Maul Flanders, like Tom, uh, Tom Jones and Tristram Shandy, they're highly metafictional. Right. Highly right. metafictional. Yeah. Self referential. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost it gets to a point. Well, this is a, it almost gets to the point where the more postmodern thing would to do would be to not be metafictional. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. right. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to tell a story straight. That's bizarre. Yeah. I don't think McCarthy shares the ideological. I mean, I would say I know he doesn't. I don't yeah. think he shares the ideological values of people like John Barth, um, of of some of the metafictionists and postmodern writers of the 1970s. I think he sets himself very far apart from that. And and I've said this before. um, I I think that this is, for me, it's not really, it's inarguable. I think McCarthy's a Catholic writer. He's not Catholic in the sense of a Graham Greene. He's not Catholic in the sense of a Flannery O'Connor, who he adored, by the way, Mm -hmm. but he was raised Catholic. Uh, all of his training is Catholic. His early schooling is Catholic, and his moral worldview is entirely Catholic. Mm. The, the the world of Blood Meridian is a world of transgression. It's a world of fall from grace. It's a world of men existing outside the 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 light of God and the light of communion. Right. It, it, when it describes various things that we've talked about, it describes them as being travesties of mass. You know, the headless Christ circling past the judge like communicants, all of these things, the ex priest, um, mm-hmm. Tobin. Right. So I, I think McCarthy, I don't think you escape Catholicism. You can say, I'm no longer a practicing Catholic. Right. But I, I think. That stuff is deep in McCarthy's work. So, so what do you make of this? Excuse me, this this Gnostic notion is this sort of like because the way because I, I agree with you and what I well yeah what do you make of all this? I mean, there's been an entire book and and a number of articles written about the Gnostic theology of Blood Meridian. How do you square that with this? Right. So there's the faith that we come from, or no faith. Right. Mm-hmm. The faith that we come from, and then there's the thing that we discover, or maybe the thing we want to believe. I believe that McCarthy is deeply invested in in some sort of Gnostic cosmology in this book. I believe it's all there. Um, I believe it's there. It's definitely there. It's, it's, It's one layer of meaning amongst many layers of meaning, right? But this... McCarthy wasn't born into Gnosticism. He was born no. into the Roman Catholic Church. Right, right? right. So there's also all of that and all the churches and all the priests and all the sure. the the liturgical language and all of that. Right. Yeah. So so I, I would say, yeah, there is a Gnostic. Uh, there are these Gnostic impulses and McCarthy uses that to achieve certain things. But he also uses I mean, if you don't have an idea of sin and transgression. It's very hard to have a book like this. That's true. Yeah. We know we know these men aren't doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. And right. we also know, like, we don't need to be told they're sinning. We understand in this world, they're sinners. They're outcasts. They're desperados. They're, mm-hmm. I mean, they are, they're outlawed, right? And, and yeah. you know, and there's all, and the narrator talks about, you know, men who, you know, run from the fires of God and, you know, outside the fires of men and, you know, where they've gone to hide from God and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so these are the men we're dealing with. We're dealing with the fallen. We're dealing with the sinners. But what's postulated are these other people. I would say the multi-ethnic cowboys who give the kid food and a knife and who the kid slander. He slanders them to Captain White and tells Captain White, they robbed me and they took everything but my knife. He converts their kindness to cruelty. Mm. There's there's Sarah Borginis who tries to take care of the character of the idiot, right? All the compassion and 
the person who saved the kid, the kid's life twice. A woman saves him at the beginning when she cares for him after he's shot. And then Bails the, on her. The, yeah, the native people save the kid and Tobin at the end in the desert. And the narrator even says, if I forget the name uh, of that tribe, it says the name of the tribe. If these people had not have found them, they would have died. Mm-hmm. Right. So in, in this world, the people that are doing acts of mercy and good are always women and um, people of color. Interesting. That, that's all through. That's all through the book. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. I, I don't think McCarthy's saying that only women and people of color are they're the only moral folks, but mm-hmm. he is showing he is showing a standard of morality and humanity against which Glanton, the rough Glanton, mm-hmm. and and Toadvine and Bath Cat and Granny yeah. Rat. I mean, can yeah. you? Can you take a child into a church and offer him unto the priest and say, I want to, I want to baptize my child and his name shall be Granny Rat, right? No, these are, <laughs> these are men who are fucked up, man. They're no, mystery. yeah, they're, they're outsiders. They're, yeah. They're, yeah. they're branded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Following on this, missing. this idea of the Catholicism in McCarthy and this novel there's something i've been meaning to say for a second which is that if you're if the book is in 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 large part about counterfeiting the the central I- irony or i'm not irony anxiety the central fear uh which is also the central article of faith in the catholic church is that that wafer that coin shaped object which is referenced many, many, many times, mm-hmm. uh, the mass and, and communion and all the rest throughout this novel, at key moments it's alluded to, is not a counterfeit. It's re- Yeah, it's real. It, it has been created. That's just a central thing. So if, you're, if this novel is talking about representation and anxiety and what truly is, and I was reading too that the Gnostics – would argue that though the Eucharist, they were, you know, the Cathars anyway, were, did not believe in the Eucharistic miracle mm-hmm. or what or whatnot. So just right. another little note uh, about like, what is the thing? Like, and, and you have to, in Catholicism, you really have to truly believe the thing is, is, is not what you're it, seeing with your this, eyes. This is so interesting. This whole conversation, Kevin, this makes hmm. me realize that so far, the companion episode that we've already done to this is oddly enough the Hieronymus Bosch episode. This, Bosch, the, yeah, yeah, very not a, not what I would have expected necessarily going into this, but there is a Boschian undercurrent because there's there's both reaffirmation and second guess and um and what what would be the word an inversion, but also a reification of of faith going on in this book it it it, there's a within blood meridian there's an argument to be a catholic and to to um depending on how you read it i think a a non a less careful reading might be to um throw all that to the wind the the world is a you know it's all nihilistic nothing really means anything anyway right yeah yeah it's this book if this book doesn't inspire you to get to church, uh, I don't know. <laughs> like maybe, you know, I read this and I go, oof. Yeah. I it go makes away. me want to go rob some banks, Kevin. Uh, okay. Well, you I'm can do both. Kidding. I'm You're just an kidding. American. I'm just kidding. You're an American, Brad. <laughs> it's a free country. <laughs> it's a free goddamn country that is blood soaked, Gnostic, horrifying, uh, but also endlessly entertaining. America is a fucking <laughs> carnival. To me. Yeah. I mean, the, I find. I'm not horrified by the violence because I don't feel the violence in this book. It feels like, or at at the very least, the representation of violence in this book doesn't hit me like the representation of violence in other books or other films. I don't feel it emotionally, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I encounter it as something else and usually as some sort of energy. Hmm. I, I mean, I mean, you know, I feel like McCarthy is not he's not saying the violence is good. He's not portraying the violence is good. He's mm-hmm. 
he's portraying the violence as unequivocal. Right. Right. And and a main and because of the epi- epigraphs, a mainstay of human affairs. This is yeah. just this is the way people are. Yeah. Like men are like this. And have and, been like this. Yeah. What's the third epigraph talking about scalping having existed in Ethiopia hundreds of thousands of years ago? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which and this, boy. And, and it's nothing so nothing changes, Kevin. Me, nothing changes, the baby. The the judge lecturing these men, these men who are carrying out extrajudicial killings for money, mm-hmm. right? The judge lectures them about war. And they reject it. They don't want to believe. And David Brown, the worst sinner amongst them, right? He tells the judge, when the judge says war is God, Brown says, you're mad, Holden, mad at last. Mm. You're crazy. Right. And and the judge is like, I'm honoring your trade, motherfucker. Right, right. But David Brown, David Brown knows he's sinning. That's the difference, right? It's like, I'm doing this, but it is a transgression, and I'm aware of that, but I'm doing it anyway. You can't have that without Catholicism. You can't have that doubleness without Catholicism. Right. David Brown and the other members are offended by the suggestion that they're not sinning. Mm. No, we lie outside the grace of God. We are committing transgressions. The judge says, no, you're not. You're involved in the more important. Oof. Oh, yeah. Well, boys, what are we <laughs> what are we going to talk about on the After Dark for Patreon? Patreon.com slash Art of Dark Pod. As you can tell, if you're new to this podcast, this is not the core of what we do. The core no. of what we do are biographical profiles of dead artists. We always wait in a, a year and a day before covering anyone. So we have not had cause or time to cover the great Cormac McCarthy yet. However... Yeah. We are breaking our own rules because of the the weight and the import of this and also Aaron's expertise and, frankly, urgency at getting out some media, some, I guess, content about this very, very important book that means a lot, I know, to all of us. Uh, Aaron, mm-hmm. what? where is your substack For people who can't get enough of the Gwyn, if you're not Gwynned out you by need now. More Gwyn, if you need more Gwyn, if you're not already sick to death of me, uh, ah. my my substack is bloodmeridian.substack right so i i have the, the i mean they've it's, it's become a blood stack blood stack blood stack <laughs> bloodstack.com so, yeah it's nice a best, so, yeah 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 so my uh yeah subscribe to my blood stack uh i'm on twitter at american quinn g-w-y-n i always post new episodes of my substack there is stuff now I've got a free tier. There's shit you can look at if you're interested um, and see if it's right for you. And then there's a paid tier if you want more. Yeah. Right. And and Aaron is a fine novelist in his own right. You can find his stuff wherever you would find such things. Uh, He's also going to be back for our book club, which we do for Patreon. And as I said at the beginning of this episode, we had Blood Meridian planned prior to Cormac passing away. That's going to be in December. Aaron will be there with us. So let's just say this is like uh, Christmas early. This is Christmas Mm -hmm. in July for people uh, who were waiting for the Blood Meridian book club event. It's a prelude. prelude. We're going to do more. We're going to be thinking about Blood Meridian for the rest of our goddamn lives, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm actually pleased that I got ahead of reading it. It felt like it had... It had been too long since I had read it. Brad, what do you want to do to close this out before we come back and go for another minimum half hour, probably an hour yeah. for this very special darkest of all dark rooms? Well, I think, you know, I, I think, what if I just pick a random passage? Okay. Yeah. Use, dark it, room. use, this, use it like divination. Oh, and by the way, on the after dark, I'm going to ask you about the tarot scene. Yeah. Oh, I want to talk about the tarot okay. parts. We're going to talk about tarot in the in Blood Meridian. And we're also just going to talk a little bit generally about how, what could Cormac McCarthy be published 
now, if he was starting out now, could Blood Meridian exist now if it was coming out now? How does this, how have things changed? How are they the same? Uh, maybe he would be at a better advantage. Who knows? But I want to get everybody, all three of us have had different relationships with that world. And I'm curious what you guys think. Um, and we're going to talk Lat- about tarot because the tarot features prominently in Blood Meridian. We haven't even talked about it. Last thing no. I'm going to say, patreon.com slash art of dark pod. If you can't chuck five American dollars or the equivalent of five American dollars at this podcast. If you don't think it's worth it, if you're a frequent listener, you've listened to three, five, ten core episodes and you're not chucking a buck. I don't know what to tell you. This thing does not make itself. These guests do not book themselves. Although Aaron, uh, Aaron has an open door. He'll come. He'll come on whenever he wants to come on. You seriously have got to be supporting shows like this if you want them to continue to exist brad and i are both generous guys brad's a father i'm a father we're both artists we are creative people we got a lot going on on in our lives if you want to see art of darkness continue for another year another two years another five years another 10 years get out your credit card get on patreon show support i'm kind of done fucking around with it like I love you if you listen. I pre- we appreciate you, but that material support goes a long way and hopefully you think of us as a little bit more than just another entertaining show that you maybe tune into once in a while. And I and I hope an episode like this really showcases what what it is we're trying to do. Yeah, Aaron. If you're not willing to lay cash on the barrel head, you better be at contriving from cold slag brute in the crucible a face that will pass. Something that will render you better counterfeit some shit and you better make it real and you better send it to my boys. I love it. I love it. We're going to close with this. We're going to close with this passage that I pulled. I just flipped through to found the first passage that I had outlined. They rode on into the darkness and the moon blanched waste lay before them cold and pale and the moon sat in a ring overhead. And in that ring lay a mock moon with its own cold gray and knacker seas. They made camp on a low bench of land where walls of dry aggregate marked an old river course, and they struck up a fire about which they sat in silence, the eyes of the dog and of the idiot and certain other men glowing red as coals in their heads where they turned. The flames sawed and the wind and the embers paled and deepened and paled and deepened like the blood beat of some living thing eviscerate upon the ground before them. And they watched the fire which does contain within it something of men themselves inasmuch as they are less without it and are divided from their origins and are exiles. For each fire is all fires, the first fire and the last ever to be. All right, that's it. Thank you, Aaron, for your time. This was amazing. Thank you, audience, for listening along with us. Um, More to come. We'll be back on the After Dark.